So, we talk about our first empire uh, that precedes 1200 by a lot. Um, it's the old Roman Empire, it's the Eastern Roman Empire. They didn't call themselves this, but what do we call them? The Byzantine Empire. All right, and they're roughly 330 when they split in Rome on the east side uh, to 1453 when they're uh, overcome by the Ottoman Turks, which we'll talk about later. So, Byzantines, they're Roman? No. 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 What are they? Greek. Mostly Greek, right? But they're, they call themselves Romans despite not being Latin people. Uh, but they do use a lot of Roman systems and Greek culture and Roman culture mix it together. So, we've got the Byzantine Empire. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with for quite a while. Uh, we have our famous emperor who reconquered the West after it fell to Germanic invaders. What was his name? Justinian. Justinian, yeah. He did a few things. And his wife, Theodora. She's actually quite famous because uh, there was one point where there was a rebellion in Constantinople, which was the next question I was going to ask, what's the capital? But there you go in Constantinople, and uh, Justinian was like, gonna bail. And she's like, I'm the empress, or you're the emperor, or something like that, and I'm not going anywhere. And so he's like, uh, okay. And so they stayed, and their elite guards actually beat the rebellion, and they got to stay there. Had they left, they probably would have lost, and it would have been a big issue, but uh, they won. So yay her. If they had, of course, lost and she died, then it would not have been yay her, but they did, so yay her. All right. Capital, Constantinople. Uh, they do, like I said, Rome is sacked and conquered by, you know, a mix of uh, the, the Visigoths and later the Lombards, all kinds of Germanic invaders. You don't need to know those details. Just know the West fell. They temporarily reconquered it for a century or so, but, I mean, it's really hard to hold on to that at this point. So, they lose it again, and for quite a while, they sit there pretty content with their holdings uh, in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, fighting their arch rivals to the east, Persia. yeah, this uh, Parthian and then Sassanid uh, Persian Empire, right? So Persia reappears after, um, of course, the Hellenistic uh, Greeks are chased out. So they battle off and on for a long time, right? So we have some uh, Persian Byzantine Wars, or Roman Wars. Those are going to exhaust both, leaving them vulnerable to somebody else later. We'll bring that up in a minute. But let's stick with Justinian here for a second. Why else do we care about Justinian, or at least the emperor after? Justinian's code. Yeah, the code. So what was the code all about? So yeah, we have, a, he, he's a great emperor, reconquered, and stuck it out, and beat the rebellion and all that. But he established Justinian's code, so why, why do we care about that? Okay, I hear, I hear a mix of good answers. Yeah, exactly. It's the first real attempt by a government uh, to form a legal system, other than just like arbitrarily making laws that enforce the hierarchy, right? We talked about it before. Most laws before just were meant to keep the people up top happy. The elite's nice and happy, paying less taxes. There are not many you know, laws that apply to them, etc. But this is the first one that really tried to make law like a profession. Like, here's a system of laws. Here's how you can interpret them. Uh, you know, started getting people that forming, form professions like lawyers. So you get the ideas of jurors and using evidence to prove things. It's not like they have this wonderful, complex system like we do now but the seeds are sown for that, all right? So it's like the world's first um, legal system that can be um, thought about, articulated, uh, interpreted, argued, uh, and that's uh, how Western law is going to start developing. Uh, that's the important sequence of it. Because uh, we will talk about that later. We talk about that later when we talk about uh, monarchs in Europe and uh, <clears throat> having a, a right to a trial, a speedy trial, at least in the United States. And then, you know, uh, treating prisoners humanely, all that kind of stuff, uh, is part of that legal system, that development of Western law. And that's kind of the start of it, Justinian's Code. So that's why you want to know uh, Justinian's Code, at least from before. Okay, cool. So we got that. Uh, is the Byzantine Empire uh, economically relevant in uh, period one? Yeah, they are. So they're a big part of the Mediterranean Sea Trade Network, obviously. They do connect with the east off and on um, through which, what's their primary city that they lose to the Arabs? Antioch. Antioch, right. So they're an, uh, certainly an economic force. Right? Religiously, they're unique religiously. They were a Christian, well, they are a Christian. 
along with the Romans, up until about 1054 CE, when something happened, what's called the Great Schism, or the East-West Schism. What happened there, though? Something split with something? Right, so that's where we have a big split in Christianity. The uh, Byzantine side goes the way of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And uh, the West stays uh, with the Pope and Roman, they become known as Roman Catholics. Before it was just Christians. Now we have specific, I guess you'd say, sects or denominations. All right, so they pretty much just copy this exact same hierarchy, right? You had Pope, Cardinals, priests all the way down, bishops, priests all the way down. Uh, who's going to run this uh, Eastern Orthodox Church? The Patriarch. The Patriarch of Constantinople, just kind of like a Pope with another name. Um, as well as bishops instead of cardinals. But before they try that, they try something else. They try having the emperor be both the political and yeah, Caesar or papism. But it becomes too difficult to have a political leader who's also your supposed moral religious leader. Because, I mean, you can't be forgiving and uh, wonderful and moral if you're uh, a political leader who has to punish people, kill people, and some of them were rather immoral uh, with their... Uh, Lifestyles, so at least according to Christian uh, morality. So Caesarian papism doesn't last. Again, that's where the religious leader is also the political leader, so the emperor. That goes out the uh, gate, but they do adopt the patriarch system, which is much like the Roman Catholic pope. And do they spread this Eastern Orthodox belief anywhere? No. Where? Who? Who does it? First of all. Uh. Cyril and Methodius, so they're primary missionaries. And which, which uh, they, they convert multiple ethnic groups. What's the largest one that they convert? Slavic. The Slavic people of Eastern Europe. So uh, this chunk-ish, I mean, there's a bunch of Catholic enclaves in there too, but this largely converts to Eastern Orthodox, uh, and that's due to the efforts of Cyril and Methodius, and those are the Slavs of Eastern Europe, and others, you know, Bulgars and things like that, but... All right, <clears throat> Byzantines though, they are weakened by invaders, uh, wars with the Persians, wars with the Arabs, as well as uh, rebellions and disease. So, they'll last for quite a while, and in fact, even though they get pushed back by the Arabs later, almost out of Turkey, they do have this moment, like a century or so, it's called the uh, Macedonian Renaissance, when they actually go back and take back a lot of the territory they lost. And then the Turks come in and just take that all back. So it's kind of a seesaw thing. But we haven't talked with the Turks yet. What was that example of rebellion that weakened the Byzantine Empire? Uh, Basil, the Copperhand. Basil the Copperhand, right. So uh, again, it didn't succeed, but weakened them financially, militaristically. Because I mean, the Byzantine Empire had to like turn around their army once or maybe twice uh, from fighting the Arabs uh, and the Caliphates uh, to come back and put down this um, rebellion. So, Basil the Copperhand. As well as, in the 1300s, a major disease epidemic. Probably the world's first epidemic. The Black Death, right? Came from where? China. China. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The Mongols did bring it across the Silk Road, but yes, it was from China, spread by the Mongols, Mongols across Asia, and it just ravaged Europe and the Mediterranean. Okay, so, weakened by uh, rebellion, disease, and of course conflicts with um, Arabs and later Turks. Or you just say Muslims. So we'll just say Arabs and Turks. Oh, and Persians. Man, it's everybody. Persians, Arabs, Turks. Most of the uh, old classical empires, Persia, Han Dynasty, uh, the, the, the Maria Gupta empires of India that we didn't learn about but existed, most of those guys are going to fall for the same reasons. A combination of, or, well, a combination of rebellions internally, disease epidemics, and uh, of course, um, conflicts with other large states. All right, so, is that all we have for the Byzantines? I think so, right? Yeah, I believe so. So, who comes out of the woodwork and defeats wipes out entirely one and pushes back another of the two largest empires at the time in the 600s. The Arabs. The Arabs, right. So out of Arabia come this uh, Muslim group, this uh, Umar, this uh, caliphate, that is going to catch the Persians and Byzantines quite off guard, who have just been punching the 
crap out of each other, essentially, uh, through a series of wars. And in fact, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I believe there was also a civil war in Persia going on. So the Arabs show up, defeat Persia, incorporate it eventually, and push the Byzantines out of Egypt and out of the Middle East. And that, why was that important to the uh, Byzantines? Because they had to trade. Yeah, that was a really lucrative area for them regarding trade. Okay, cool. So let's zoom in on Islam then, because they bust out of uh, Arabia in the 6 and 700s. All right, so who started it? Muhammad. Muhammad. All right, Islam. And he is going to have that vision in the desert, of course, writing his beliefs down on the Quran, the Quran right? In Arabic. Um, what are the five pillars? Hajj, one true God, Hajj, one true God and Muhammad the Prophet. Ramadan, five times a day, or fasting, yeah. 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 Almsgiving, nice, cool. So we've got uh, one God, which is Allah, just the name for God in Arabic. Muhammad is the Prophet. We've got, these aren't in order, by the way. Uh, the Hajj, we've got fasting. We've got the uh, praying five times a day towards Mecca. As well as, we forget, oh, almsgiving. So, um, Islam then, some of these beliefs, are these all original ideas? No. no. They've syncretized some beliefs. What did they syncretize? Fasting. <clears throat> fasting, okay, they, could, they certainly syncretized fasting, likely from Christianity or Judaism. Okay, what else? Monotheism, right, from Zoroastrianism, Christianity, and Judaism at that point. Right, and they're surrounded by that. You've got Zoroastrianism here, Judaism, Christianity here. They're surrounded by that. What about, what Arabic beliefs did they keep, though? Uh, the yeah, the Hajj, the Kaaba, that's in Mecca, all right? That's going to be kept from their pagan Arab beliefs, and they're going to kind of mix those things all uh, to make what is the structure of Islam. Cool. Um, he tries going to Mecca and, you know, showing this new system off, but uh, they don't like it. Why don't they like it? Almsgiving, giving, right? Because this is a particularly wealthy and corrupt city. So he goes to Medina, gets some support, takes over Mecca, and keeps on going and conquers all of the Arab territories in where? In Arab? <laughs> Arabian Peninsula. That's, it's largely Saudi Arabia now. But yeah, the Arabian Peninsula is united, and that's when they come out and they surprise everybody. They push back, defeat the Persians. They push back and uh, don't defeat the Byzantines, but push them out of the Middle East and uh, North Africa, and they keep going. So Muhammad unites the Arabs, then he dies. And we immediately have a controversy in the 600s. What's the controversy? Uh, who, should who should rule? Right, so the Sunni say Caliphs, Caliphs and the Shia say Ramadan. Right, so we immediately have a split as soon as Muhammad dies between the Sunni and the Shia. Right, they believe brother in law should lead. I don't know why they consider that blood relative because it's through marriage, but you know, whatever. Uh, and they believe a caliph should be the leader. Okay, what's a caliph? Uh, a religious and political leader. Yeah, a religious and political leader. Okay, cool. Uh, Islam, though, that's what the caliphate is essentially going to be initially, believes in this community of believers uh, where when you convert, you become a part of this community, and it's your duty to protect Islam and spread it. What was that concept? Umar. Umar, Umar right. So this Umar is going to be a literal military force initially, and when a caliph is leading it, who has religious and political authority, what is that type of government called? Caliphate. Caliphate, right. So they go around. Uh, after Muhammad, we have a period known as the Four Caliphs. They're leading things, and they conquer into Persia, into North Africa, into Mesopotamia. Uh, ah, but they come across a good civilization that knows how to, to administer empires. Persia. Persia, Persia, right. So they start adopting centralized administration, uh, I guess, policies or tactics, and uh, they start developing these local rulers that are not religious authority figures. They still have to enforce the religious laws, but they can't change religious laws or ideas. Uh, but they are political leaders, and those are so sultans. Yeah, exactly. And the rulers of these provinces or regions are sultans. And what, what do we call that type of form of government? Sultanate, right. Remember the difference. A caliph has both religious and political authority, much like a Caesar or papism type thing. But caliph, or sorry, sultans 
have to enforce the religious laws, but they can't change them, right? But they can change their own local political laws, exactly. Okay, and that becomes the dominant form of government uh, for Arabs, okay. But however, we have a, uh, uh, well, human nature takes over, and we have a, uh, uh, a more so greed-based uh, coup slash takeover, a, uh, a, a tribe or portion of this group is going to run things until about 750. What is that uh, new caliphate going to be called? Umayyad, right. So they're conquering North Africa, into Spain, into Central Asia, Persia, and they are the ones that get to be Turks. They even defeat two, I think it was them, that defeat the Tong Dynasty, which was in China as they were expanding westward. All right, so they stopped Chinese expansion. All right, so that's Umayyad. Until about 750. And then who, uh, who usurps power from them? Abbasid, right. And they're going to be the ones that last, uh, even though they don't run over, rule over directly this entire area, it's mostly just local sultanates that are paying tribute to them. But uh, this Abbasid Caliphate is going to last all the way until about 1258, when who destroys their primary city of Baghdad? The Mongols, right. Mongols come in, destroy the city. But uh, Caliphates continue. So Mongols end this. And again, remind me what their uh, imperial city was called again? Baghdad. Baghdad, right. We'll talk more about that next week as far as like, you know, how they had uh, the, the House of Wisdom and all that stuff. But uh, so Baghdad's destroyed. However, most of the caliphate's military force at this point is not just Arabs. In fact, they're mostly non-Arabs. So whether they're uh, uh, Persians or the peoples of Mesopotamia or Egyptians or Turks or whoever they are, What's the term we use for that? The Mamluks, right. So even though they lose the Mongols and they're chased back, the Mamluks actually move and establish a caliphate where? Mesopotamia. Not Mesopotamia. Egypt. Egypt. Egypt, yeah. So we actually have like a Mamluk. I'm running out of room here. I'll start over here again. Uh, a Mamluk run uh, caliphate state. And that lasts for uh, a very long time, actually. So it's that weird situation where non-Arab, non-Egyptians are going to rule Egypt for quite a while. Uh, all the way up until, as far as I know anyway, they're not really chased out or their power isn't quite taken until um, uh, another Muhammad, and Muhammad Ali does it in the uh, mid-19th century when they form the Ketubate of Egypt. That's a topic way down the road, though. All right, so that's everything except how they convert people inside of uh, the caliphate, right? Mm -hmm. We covered all the other stuff, though? Yeah. 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 The what? The first class citizen. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Cool. So, a lot of people were converted uh, because either they liked Islam's uh, egalitarian appeal with the almsgiving, uh, or they just were impressed by the military uh, success, and they were willfully adopted. But two groups were very resistant to uh, Muslim conversion. What were those two groups? Yeah, Christians and Jews, right. So we have some Christian and Jewish resistance uh, to conversion. Uh, but the uh, Muslim state went a little easier on them because they considered them, uh, I can't remember their phrase, Brothers of the Book or something like that, since they're all rooted in that whole uh, old Jewish like Torah uh, origin. So they have a policy meant to encourage conversion, not force it. So I can still be, technically, I mean, it's not like it's perfect or wonderful, but it's better than death. Um, they can still be Christian or Jew, Jewish uh, adherents in these caliphates and sultanates, but what's the consequence? There's a price, literally. Yeah. There's a literal price. So there's the uh, jizya tax, or maintaining, these are for non-Muslims, right? Specifically Christians and Jewish people for the most part. Uh, a tax for non-Muslims. So you can still do it. You're still protected by the state, but you got to pay a fee, literally. And also, they're not quite seen and treated equally. They're second class. Second class. Yeah, they're second-class citizens. So uh, that's, that's the Dimi status. And that means there's certain positions not available to them. They can't be a part of the government, the military. Uh, it also means people will not treat them well. So obviously, I'm surrounded by mostly Muslim people. It's going to be a bit harder to, you know... Uh, live peacefully or engage uh, in business uh, or ask favors or trust them. So they, are, they do have to live with that stigma. And a lot of people are either going to leave the areas ruled by the Muslims, speaking about Jews and Christians, uh, and go, some of them go into Central Asia. They're not going to see much success there, though. Uh, and a lot of them go into uh, Europe, right? So this Jewish 
population in Europe is going to balloon even further than it did from just the Jewish diaspora. All right, Christians too, but Christianity already dominates Europe since the Romans. So, all right, that's everything we covered, right? Yeah. Sweet. We'll pick up there later. Have a good one. Study hard. So who were my... Uh, who were my Turks that were converted, and then you're going to go ahead and start some conquests here. Seljuk. Yeah, Seljuks. So, if you guys remember the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphates reached out to Central Asia, converted some of those Turkish tribes, they become Sunni Muslim, and they're going to go on their own uh, wave of conquest. They're going to come in, they're going to conquer into Persia, right, thus kind of making them Turco-Persian. Uh, they're Sunni Islam, and they're going to chase the Byzantine Empire out of Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey. Um, Arabs, they were locked in with the Arabs there for a couple hundred years, but then, uh, well, like 300 years. Then the Seljuk Turks come in, they beat the Byzantines at the uh, Battle of Manzikert in 1071, and chase them, uh, the Byzantines, out of Anatolia. So they're going to take this, some territory in the Middle East, and they're going to hold on to that from, I believe it was 1037 to about 12, 1260. Who's the, uh, who's the empire that comes in behind them and chases them out of there? The Mongols. Yeah, the Mongols. Okay, cool. So, one thing I forgot to mention, I think, earlier on Monday, was this scared a lot of uh, Christians because it chased the Byzantine Empire, who actually was, like, on the offensive and getting territory back and doing well in the thousands-ish. Uh, they got chased out. And this is where Europeans, so like the uh, emperor of uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Holy Roman Emperor and all the kingdoms of Europe. In 1095, this is in your notes, but I totally forgot to talk about it. In 1095, they're gonna start the uh, first crusade. Anybody know what, what a crusade is? Like, like knights. Okay, they do use knights, part of the feudal system. Like, the Christians want that to like, take over the Holy Land. Yeah, exactly. So they, they basically lost the Christian and Jewish holy cities of like Jerusalem and some of those areas that like Jesus and them were in. So. They wanted it back from the uh, Muslims. So this is where uh, a lot of Christian kings, like the Holy Roman Emperor, the uh, kings of France, England, and others, the Byzantine Empire even a little bit, they're going to pay for and fund uh, a European invasion of the Middle East. Uh, they have three or four, I don't know, actually it might have been more than that, Right, because the fourth one, I think, was the one where they actually just went for Constantinople, not even the Middle East. But regardless, the first couple were decently -ish successful. I mean, they didn't like totally win out or anything, but they did take eventually and hold on to a decent chunk of territory in the Middle East. So that's what the Crusades are. So I think, I think the Crusaders are chased out in the uh, 13th century, but for a couple centuries, three-ish centuries, uh, the Christians are going to hold on to a lot of territory, build like castles. That's why if you like go there, there's some like old rundown like European castles in the Middle East. Uh, it was because of the Crusades. Uh, and they're going to hold on that for a little while, but they do eventually get chased out because I mean, how they can't really they can't realistically fund and provide a bunch of troops across the Mediterranean Sea from these tiny little feudal kingdoms. Like they're not the Roman Empire; they can't keep that up. So eventually, they do get chased out. But that's what the Crusades are, uh, and the reason why I mention this is that's going to breed a lot of hostility between the uh, Muslim states and the Christian states. Uh, that's going to continue onward for a while. Uh, in fact, because of this the Islamic states are pretty much going to cut off the Europeans from trade with India uh, and China. Uh, and that's going to come up again later in the Age of Exploration. But that's what the Crusades are. So about a two-century-ish period where Europeans took and held on to some territory in the Middle East because that's where Jerusalem was. Does that make sense? All right, that's the Crusades, which I forgot to mention before. I can't really hear the last one, but it's basically about the 11th to 19th, so 13th century. All right. However, the Mongols come in in 1260 behind the Seljuks, uh, take much of their territory, and of course chase them around Europe. I told you guys about that. They like a fraction of the Mongol army goes in and beats like all the Eastern European powers. Um, they're going to set up what kind of governments uh, in the Turks over in Anatolia? Emirates. Emirates, right. So the Mongols are going to start Emirates which are like, you know, tiny little feudal kingdoms, essentially. And uh, which one of these emirates is going to emerge as the uh, conquest? Ottoman. Yeah, they're going to conquer the rest and start the Ottoman Empire. Right. From out of those emirates comes the Ottoman Empire. 
and they're going to go from uh, the late 1200s all the way to 1922. So not even 100 years ago, they were still technically an Ottoman Empire. All right. Um, what else am I saying? What is an emirate, though? Yeah, so who runs it then? Yeah, one of the Turkic or Arab or whoever it is, uh, lords that are there. It's kind of like a little feudal state, basically. Uh, and they have to kind of like pay tribute to the Mongol Empire. But eventually they break away, obviously, and start their own uh, after they're conquered by the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire, or the Ottomans from, the, uh, from that emirate. All right, so that is, those are the Seljuk Turks. We good on that? All right, how does Islam get into India? Yeah, so those Persian Turco invaders are going to also turn their sights to uh, at least northwestern India. So pretty quickly, around this territory-ish is going to be uh, under the control of the uh, city, of the Sultanate of Delhi, which are going to be, it's going to be the first major Muslim empire uh, in India. All right, it's going to last about 300 years, Delhi Sultanate. Remember, those are Turkish uh, and Persian invaders coming in uh, to bring Islam. What's the dominant religion there, though, before, I, before we ask, answer your question? Hinduism. Hinduism. Hinduism, right. What was your question to me? Um, so right below that, were those the camel kings? Or? Yeah, down here mm -hmm. in the corner. You saw the, the History of the World video or whatever? Yeah, that's okay. a good one. That's a good one. But yeah, um, I actually know very little about those, and most, so do most people. They're not even in the uh, AP World curriculum. But yes. Uh, most of these empires will be centered around the northern regions of, uh, of India. Like the earlier empires, like the Maurya Gupta empires and things like that. They, for the most part, don't incorporate this bottom half uh, because of that. Uh, regardless, Delhi Sultanate. It's going to go about 1206 to 1526. And uh, it's not the smoothest empire. It lasts three centuries. They technically hold off the Mongols uh, when they try invading or they're in the area anyway. Uh, but what are some problems that plague these guys? Religious conflict. Yeah, with who? Uh, Muslim. Hindu. Hindu. So they're Muslims. Who are they? Who are they in conflict oh, with? Uh, yeah, the Hindu people. That's mostly uh, Hindi people. So we have a lot of Hindu-Muslim conflicts because there are several Hindu kingdoms here, and they're not too happy about uh, the approach of the Delhi Sultanate. Because uh, what are these Muslims like? Are they those nice, sort of, convert you by peaceful ways, sort of, uh, empire? No. no. They're what? They Yeah, they're iconoclasts, right? They destroy Hindu temples and relics. They uh, essentially force uh, strict taxes. So Hindu-Muslim conflicts. Uh, they are, at least at times in history, iconoclastic. I mean, of course, they destroy Hindu temples, relics, things like that. And they uh, have a pretty extreme taxation policy. Uh, that the Hindu people are not really willing to pay up, but they have to by force for a while. But I mean, if you try to rule a government through force, I mean, it's just not going to last as long as it could. Like, pretty much all of the long-lasting empires of the world, Rome, some of the Chinese dynasties, like, they weren't overly strict or demanding on people, uh, and they lasted a lot longer. All right, so iconoclastic, uh, overtaxation. Going to be their downfall. The Mughals take over, but that's not till period two. We'll talk about that in period two. You guys get the Delhi Sultanate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Islam's going to spread. Those are the uh, areas it spreads to uh, through conquest. Any different color. Through conquest. What areas do, does it spread to uh, by trade? So, actually, let's recap this. Let's do the black regions. It's by conquest. So, we definitely have the Delhi Sultanate, obviously. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have Anatolia, because that's where the Turks go. They're the Ottomans. But where else was... Converted by conquest. Middle East. Middle East. North Africa. North Africa. Spain. Parts of Spain, yeah. Uh, Central, Central Asia. Persia. Central Asia and Persia. So Persia, Central Asia. Right, you can't forget where it originated, the Arabian Peninsula. All right, not the perfect map, but that's roughly where Islam's going to spread to by conquest. The Ottoman Empire will bring it into like south southeastern Europe later, but that's not till later. All right, so where does it spread by trade, though? West and East, West and East Africa. Okay, West and East Africa. All right, why am I not highlighting here? Because it's desert. desert. Sahara Desert, yeah. West African kingdoms, East African kingdoms, where else? Uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, Asia, parts of it anyway. Parts of the islands. Indonesia. Indonesia, yeah. These are the areas in which Buddhism is going to spread uh, by trade. All right, but I want to know how. How does it spread by trade? Why would people peacefully convert just because 
Well, why would they? Trade benefits. Yeah, you get the trade benefits. So which states are at the center of pretty much all world trade at the time? Muslim states, Christian states, Chinese dynasties, what? Muslim states, right. So you've got like the Umayyad, the Abbasid Caliphate, and other caliphates and sultanates inside of there. Uh, they're pretty much connected to all major trade routes at the time. What are those major trade routes? Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean Trade Network. Silk Road. Silk Road, yeah. Mediterranean, Mediterranean. Mediterranean Sea Trade Network. Trans yeah, Trans-Saharan. In fact, in this era, at roughly 1000 CE, they make this connection. Some Arabs uh, domesticate camels. They form caravans, which are large groups that bring water and supplies so you don't just die in the desert. And camels can survive much longer in the desert. So we have caravans that actually officially connect West Africa across the desert for the first time, starting about 1000 CE. Where am I going to write that? 1000 CE. Arabs cross Sahara. Right, so that connects West Africa with these Arabs. So, who do the Arabs learn how to govern through? Persians. The Persians, right. The West Africans are going to do the same thing. They're going to learn how to govern, govern through the Arabs, who of course learned through the uh, Persians. All right, so West Africans actually benefit quite a bit from this connection. All right, they get access to, to goods through trade, right, and they also learn how to govern themselves, or at least better, because uh, the Arabs learn from the Persians and they pass that on for the most part. All right, but West Africa, it gets to West Africa, and why is it different in West Africa than the other areas that we've labeled in black? They don't enforce it. They don't enforce it on everybody. Who, who largely converts to Islam in West Africa? The kings and nobles. Yeah, the kings and nobles, the people that rule, right? Why would they do that? I just explained trade. some of the benefits. Trade. trade, but they also wanted to learn from them, like how to run the government, things like that. Cool. So, West Africa is connected. So the first connection was with the Empire of Ghana. Um, and now we have um, uh, Mali in about the, what one was it exactly? So we have Ghana from about the 600s to the 1200s, and then in the 1200s to about the 1600s, we have Mali. All right, those are the two main empires in that rough area here. Now, the uh, cities that, at the edges here that are connected to trade routes, those become the most wealthy, obviously. What's the major one in Mali that comes to? Timbuktu, yeah. And these guys become rather wealthy because they have a couple things that Arabs want. They have a lot of gold, right? Especially Mansa Musa. Oh, I should have asked that as a question, but whatever. Uh, Mansa Musa. Uh, they have a lot of uh, salt and copper, but the Arabs also start in roughly 1000 CE. Uh, what trade? It involves people. Slaves. Slaves. Slaves, yes. This is where the West African slave trade begins, like 500 years before the Portuguese do it. Uh, it's already been ongoing. So this is where West African kingdoms go out, gather slaves, and then they sell them or trade them to uh, anyone who's willing to buy. In this case, it's going to be the Arabs, and they're going to do that for several centuries. All right. So we have gold, copper, salt, and slaves are going to be the primary things traded. Uh, and again, who was that ruler of Mali with all the gold that... Yeah. He actually he had so much gold he caused inflation in the uh, caliphates uh, as he went on his Hajj uh, journey. Because he was just handing it out so much that it just reduced the value of it. That's how much he had. Right? So, uh, of course, that's Mansa Musa. But again, the key attribute here is the reason why they, the upper echelons of West African society become Islamic or Muslim is because they wanted to trade benefits and they wanted to learn uh, Arab administration. All right, so make sure you don't forget that. So I would say the why Islam administration advice as well as uh, trade with the caliphates. Those are the reasons why. And again, don't forget, they don't enforce it on their citizenry. All right, so like over here, you have to become a Muslim or else what happens? Good yeah, good good good. and Dimi status, right, exactly right. Uh, you're basically forced to or penalized for not doing it. West Africa, though, they're not going to care until the Songhai dynasty, but that's later in period two. All right, I have to like check myself because I keep wanting to see the old ones from last year, but we've got new ones. All right, uh, any questions about West Africa? Okay, what else did I talk about with that? Just the diaspora? Oh, and the Golden Age, too, that's right. 
So, these blue areas, we talked about why they converted in West Africa, but why are all these other blue areas, why did they become Muslim? Why are people in that area converting? Because it's not like there's just so many Arabs and Turks moving out here that they take over the population. They do go there. These uh, diasporic communities go out there, but they're still small. Why do the people around them convert to Islam? Trade. The trade right, they want access to the trade benefits because the peoples that are connected with all the trade routes essentially back then uh, are the Muslim states. So these merchants would start towns, so the black will be obviously Arabs or Muslims. They go out and start these uh, little towns and mosques in these areas uh, to connect to the edges of the trade routes. And then, of course, if people want to trade with them, they're better off uh, being Muslim to do that, to even engage in trade or to get good deals or whatever. Uh, so what you have here very quickly is the areas in which these Arab merchants go convert to Islam uh, to get those trade benefits. All right, so does that make sense? What's a diasporic community? Yeah, it's spreading. So it's like majority Arabs here, but then a tiny little uh, chunk of them goes and settles uh, surrounded by other people. So, diasporas in period one. We have certainly the Muslim diaspora. We have technically two more. What's the other one I've talked about that had Chinese. Chinese. Yeah, Chinese, right? So we talk about the Song Dynasty next. A lot of uh, Chinese merchants are going to settle in these, um, you know, Southeast Asian areas and cities and establish merchant communities. Right? And we still have those. Places like Singapore uh, is still mostly Han Chinese, even though it's surrounded by Malay and Thai people. All right, so the Chinese, this one I didn't talk about as much. I talked about more from like the pre-1200 era, but there's another group of people that are kind of wandering the earth without a homeland, settling along trade routes and in Europe. Who are those people that got displaced by the Romans? Jewish. The Jewish people, right. So I've still got a lot of Jewish people sort of wandering around, settling along the, the Silk Road, and a lot of them uh, in Europe too. So those are my major diasporas. Any questions about that? Sweet. This is the golden age of Islam. So what are some technological or cultural innovations that come out of this golden age of Islam when the Muslim states uh, dominate the wealth uh, and territory of the uh, post-classical era? True. All right, sweet. So we've got some inventors of algebra and trig or at least some refiners of algebra. Inventors of trigonometry. Do we have any female literature? Yes. 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 I'm going to spell these names wrong. So I got Aisha. 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 Yeah, Aisha. Let's, let, let's not spell this wrong. We find it. These are new terms from the new uh, uh, curriculum. All right, cool. So uh, female literature, or at least Arabic female literature. We have Aisha. Let me spell this bad boy correctly. I can't read my writing, so I guess that doesn't do any good. Al Baniya. Baniya. There we go. All right, and the uh, inventor of trigonometry, that one I can actually read. Nasir al Din al Al Turi. Good luck on the quiz of those. So. Uh, those are the prominent uh, Muslim intellectuals and writers of the time. And uh, also, too, they make some advancements for medicine. What do they do with medicine? Regarding Traveling hospitals. Yeah. Hospitals. What else? Traveling, Traveling, Traveling clinics, clinics, which is kind of like traveling hospitals. What else? Sorry, yeah, they start tracking specific diagnoses, trying to predict what's going to happen, avoid it, cure it, things like that. All right, so um, a lot of medical advances. Well, you guys know those at least. All right, and a lot of this knowledge, whether it was Greek or Roman or Persian or Arab or whatever it was, was stored in a large uh, library or house that was much like the old library of Alexandria before that got burned down. What was it? The Baghdad House of Wisdom. Yeah, the House of Wisdom in uh, Baghdad. What's that, that the capital of? Um, okay, yeah, now it's Iraq. But what was it the capital of? I knew I'd catch you off guard. This is, that was last week. Who, who knows it anymore? Abbasid. The Abbasid Caliphate, right. That's where the Mongols roll in, uh, siege them, and destroy pretty much everything, burn down the House of Wisdom. So whatever was in it, we don't know. Oh, quick refresher. 
When uh, Baghdad does get sieged and the Abbasid Caliphate falls to the Mongols, a lot of those uh, non-Arab military personnel, called what? Mamluks moved their caliphate where? Egypt. To Egypt for quite a while, right. Okay. That's the golden age of Islam. Right? Yeah. Oh, the one other thing I want to mention is a couple technologies trickle across these caliphates uh, to Europe from like China or even just themselves. What were a few of those technologies? Gunpowder. Okay, gunpowder is actually the Mongols. If I said that last week, that was a mistake. All right, uh, but printing and paper, as well as uh, technological, or sorry, navigational technology like the astrolabe, which is basically, it reads the stars to tell you how far north or south you are on the planet. Uh, and even the compass later are gonna come across uh, that way. So astrolabe, compass, and again, compass always points north so you know what direction you, you're going. Those are going to travel through and make their ways up. And uh, lastly, I know I mentioned this last week, but what was the cultural clothing item that the Arabs copied from the Persian the upper? Veils. Yeah, the veils. Right, exactly. So that is the golden age of Islam. Any questions about that? Sweet, moving on. Now we have the golden age of imperial China. Oh, let's see if you guys can give me the uh, five... Um, they're not all after 1200. In fact, two of them are preceding it, but it's better to know them <clears throat> and how they contributed to Chinese society going forward. It's like a unit zero. If this is unit one, that's like a unit zero type thing. Um, what was my, who remembers the five dynasties that we? Song, Song, Yudong, Ming. Nice. Nice. Oops. It's reversed. One. Uh, which one of these bad boys banned and crushed Buddhism with the edicts on Buddhism? Tang. 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 Which ones chased out the Mongols? Song. Nope. Ming. Ming. Which one were the Mongols? Yuan. Which one? Re-established a unified Chinese state system and made the Grand Canal. Su, yeah, good. I think like two thirds you're getting these. This isn't bad because I just like gave you the list yesterday. So what the hell did the Song Dynasty do? Foot binding. That's a memorable one. Okay, we'll go over them. That's not that's not bad though, considering you guys had no idea what these were like barely 24 hours ago. All right. Sue, so, uh, very short-lived, but the reason why we want to know about them is they sort of reunified China. There's, it's not as bad as the Warring States period, but there is a period of disunity in China after the fall of the Han uh, till the Sioux Dynasty. Now, they, there is like a Jin Dynasty in between, but we don't really care about that. It doesn't unify all of the Han Chinese people. Sioux so does, though. Short-lived, but again, they reestablish unified China. They make the Grand Canal, which is very helpful for the Chinese economy and people. Uh, but they're quickly taken over by the Tang. And that's going to be roughly 600 to 900 CE-ish. What did the Tong do? There's a few things. Edicts of Buddhism. Okay, they go after Buddhism. So before we get to going after Buddhism, which we already mentioned, what are they doing that motivates them to go after Buddhism? Expanding. Expanding, right. So they're going to expand the territory of what was the Han Dynasty. Uh, through parts of Central Asia under Mongolia, or sorry, into Central Asia, past Mongolia. Uh, and they're only going to be stopped by the um, uh, Umayyad Caliphate, right? Remember when they, they hired those Turkish mercenaries, the Chinese did, and then the, the Umayyad just paid them more, so they swapped sides and won the battle for the, Abbas, or the Umayyad Caliphate. So China expands quite a bit, but that is not going to be cheap. So Tong, they're going to expand China substantially. But uh, that's not cheap. So, how do they go after getting some money? The, the they go after the Buddhist temples, right. So, uh, they make illegal, or they ban, Buddhism with a series of laws known as Edicts on Buddhism, Buddhism in the 800s, Emperor Wutsong. And uh, not that they were lying, but what's the reason they give for uh, banning Buddhism? Yeah, it breaks the social harmony and unity of Confucianism, right? And it does. They're not wrong. 
right? But what was the behind the scenes reason? Money. They wanted the money. Wanted the money. Wait, I thought Buddhists didn't have any money. But they could have their temples. What brand of, of uh, Buddhism do I have in China? Yeah, it's called Mahayana, right? So the Buddhists in China are Mahayana, and they don't, you know, spend riches on themselves, but they kind of see Buddha's, or, sorry, Buddha as a deity. So they'll spend a lot of money bejeweling, bedazzling the temples and the golden figurines of Buddha and stuff like that. So the Tong, they definitely do go after Buddhism uh, because it's uh, anti-Confucianism, right? They lose their social harmony and traditions and social order and all that stuff. But also, they wanted that uh, money from the uh, Buddhist temples, the Mahayana Buddhist temples. So they ban it, soldiers go in, wreck the place up, Buddhism pretty much gets booted out of China for the most part. Bless you. Extreme sneezes. <laughs> um, Buddhism pretty much gets booted out of China. They melt down the stuff, they get the money, and uh, reinstate Confucianism. So, what is that called, by the way? It starts in the Tong, goes to the Song. Yeah, Neo-Confucianism. It's like a refocusing on Confucianism. Right, so this is actually kind of a Tong and Song. But it definitely starts with the Tong. So, we have Neo-Confucianism. Thanks to the writings of Han Yu, or partially thanks to that. So what do they do besides re-emphasizing it? They do, they do something with their government to make it uh, harder to get into. You're going to take the exam. Yeah, they like reinstate or make more difficult the Confucian examination system. What's the highest positions besides the emperor in China? The government. Yeah, the government positions, right? That, that's a big part of their Confucian hierarchy. So to get those jobs, uh, you have to pass some incredibly difficult Confucian examination uh, well, examinations, essentially. Like they, the upper class Chinese would, you know, pay tutors to, you know, uh, uh, tutor their sons for years to take these things. They would still fail, right, to become a government official. But that was the goal. So that's Neo-Confucianism. They're going to bring back the Confucian examination system. The one other thing the Tong does is they are going to conquer into uh, Southeast Asia a little bit. They come in contact with the uh, Vietnamese people, or the Viet people, and uh, they're going to borrow the rice from that Champa empire, which is named after that empire, Champa, Champa rice, right. And that rice is going to help grow their population because it's rice that's more drought resistant, and it uh, cultivates in half the time. So very quickly, you have a very good and drought resistant form of rice. More food always equals more people, so we have population growth during the Tang dynasty. Good on the Tong? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So we're almost to actual 1200 in China now. Now we're to 1200. Who's going to take over after the Tong dynasty? Song. Yeah, Song. From like 900 ish, it's like 918 or something, to, well, whenever the Mongols show up. 76? Whatever, 1200s. All right. Mm. So, there's a couple things the Song do. They, of course, keep the Neo-Confucianism uh, uh, momentum going. They, of course, uh, solidify that state system. They do lose the Mongols later. But what are some of their main contributing uh, contributions to history? Some of them good, some of them not so good. Book binding, Book binding right, okay. Not that necessarily like they forced all women to do this, but it became a common practice back then as a part of the more patriarchal family establishment back then, was that women would footbind. Uh, why would they do this, though? To uh, so high class. class. It, it was an upper class thing, exactly. So back then, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, why was it better to be lighter skinned? Because you're not laboring. Yeah, not that it's actually better, obviously. But they thought, thought of it as, if you're lighter skinned, that means you're inside, which means you're not working, which means you're higher class, because you have enough money to not work. So they wanted to be paler, and they also uh, wanted to uh, show they need to work. So by foot binding and making your foot like the size of a, a smashed up fist as you grow up, I mean, can I work a field if I got a foot like that? No, no. no not even. Right, so that's a sign of class, like, oh, I don't need to work because I, I have my foot ba feet bound voluntarily, or at least your parents voluntarily did it to you. Um, and then uh, you were generally more pale. It was also a sign of like feminine beauty to, to them back then. Obviously, we think it's disgusting, and it is. And it just looks disgusting, but uh, they saw it as a sign of feminine beauty. So, foot binding. It's always a good one to be known for. Alright, the other one they're known for. 
that is different from most civilizations back then is they start trying to make a profitable government enterprise. What is it called when I'm doing something for profit? Commercialization. Commercialization. Right. They are going to become commercialized, at least partly. All right, again, just to recap, back then, most people weren't working for profit. They worked for somebody as a slave or a serf or a peasant or whatever, right? And they would just pay with their labor. Uh, and that would get them protection, but then they couldn't leave and they had to keep doing that work. This is different though. This is I'm trying to sell it and make money, which gives me more incentive to do that. Europeans are going to take that and run with it later. But the Chinese are the ones that uh, really started doing it, at least on a state level. So they have kind of a, an early industrial revolution-ish. Uh, they use like the water wheel and several other things to learn how to uh, smelt steel much better or quicker than anybody else in the world. They like burn down entire forests to do it, but uh, they do it better than anybody else. So they have a lot of iron and steel works. What are other things that people want to buy from China? Porcelain. Porcelain. Silk. 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 right. They find out they can make a lot of money trading with the rest of the world, right? So this is what starts that Chinese diaspora where they send out Muslim, or sorry, not Muslim, merchant communities uh, to connect with the Indian Ocean Trade Network. And they find out that people of India, and the Muslim states, and even Africa really want these things. And they can make a lot of money off of it. So they go all in. And they form an organization. Maritime. 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 Trade supervisor, all right? That is what's going to be a government entity. Maritime means by ocean, by sea. Maritime, oh, I already forgot it. Trade supervisor. So that was a government entity, <clears throat> the 900s, that either sold stuff for profit for the government or who would they tax? Imports. Imports or the merchants, right? The imports that they would get. Right, and that would funnel a lot of money into the uh, Song uh, government. So again, they would tax imports. It's called a tariff, by the way. Uh, and they would also sell goods directly themselves. And what, are, what is this money going for? Obviously, some of it corruptly goes to the government officials, but what else is it going for to help China? Infrastructure? Military. Military, right. And uh, that's going to really help them out. <clears throat> so they commercialize and expand uh, their maritime trade. All right. Who was the last real Chinese person, or at least dynasty, that briefly tried this maritime trade thing and it worked out pretty well? The Ming with Admiral Tseng Ha. They're the last ones to do this. And then they make the terrible mistake of, uh, so in, the, in the 1400s they did this, they reversed it. They said, screw it, we're not going to pay for ships and trade. We're going to focus on preventing another Mongol invasion. Um, but it's not gonna work. They're still gonna get northern invaders. They're not Mongols, but they're still northern pastoral invaders, uh, and they're gonna fall later on to that. But it's gonna be a big problem. We'll talk about it later when we talk about the Spanish. Any questions about the Song Dynasty? Nada? All right. So it is the golden age of Imperial China. They're doing rather well. They're wealthy. Everyone wants their stuff, and they want nothing. So. How does that, how is that reflected in their attitude? What new concept did they come up with? Tribute oh. system. Not the, well, yeah, the tribute system, but like, what's their attitude first? How do they see themselves compared to others? Middle Kingdom. Middle Kingdom, North. Middle Kingdom right? Like the center or, you know, an elevated portion of civilization. Right, so they start getting condescending and cocky. They see themselves as the center of the world. And they, they were, I don't want to say they were right, but de people definitely wanted their stuff. And they did not want much from other people. Right, so this is where we start getting what you guys already mentioned, that tribute system. What is this tribute system? How does it work? They give the bag for trade. Yeah, if, I, if I'm a, a non-Chinese person, doesn't matter who I am, just non-Chinese, and I want to trade with uh, China, I have to either beg, I have to present a gift and pretty much beg uh, the Chinese emperor or a Chinese official uh, to engage in trade. It's called a bestowal, to give that gift and return it. So the Chinese could just say, no, your gift's not good enough, or we don't like your people, or whatever. Uh, or they could say yes, and they would often backhandedly give you an even better gift to say, we don't even need your stuff, we're just allowing you to trade with us, because uh, we're nice. So that's the first part of it. You've got to offer a gift and beg to trade. What about the surrounding countries of like, or states uh, in Japan, 
Philippines, Indonesia, uh, the Champa Empire, yeah. the Khmer Empire. Yeah, like like an an yeah, like a protectorate. So they had to like essentially pay, at least annually, for the Chinese to protect them slash not invade them. All right, so that's a two-parter. So uh, beg slash gift for trade, but also you had the protectorate states. So the surrounding smaller states in Philippines, Indonesia, Champa Empire, Khmer Empire, Japan, Korea, all had to sort of pay tribute for protection uh, from the Chinese, or by the Chinese. You guys got that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Now let's do feudalism. We'll be done. So, what is feudalism? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start with how it works then, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, when? How about when is feudalism? The medieval. Dark age. medieval. The, dark age. the medieval, yeah, dark ages slash middle ages, right. So what, what do all those times essentially mean? What time to what time? Uh, 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 Roman uh, fall to Re yeah. Renaissance. Fall of Rome to the Renaissance, right? This is the middle ages or the dark ages, at least the first part of it, uh, or the middle e medieval times, all right? And this is about 485 CE to about 1450 CE. Renaissance means rebirth, by the way, so Europe wakes up. They come out of their slumber of doing nothing for a thousand years. All right, <clears throat> Middle Ages. So what was lost when Rome fell over here in Western Europe? Because remember, the Byzantines keep going, so they're, keep, they're rolling. But the Europeans over here in the West, uh, what did they lose? The protection. protection. From who? From the Greek invaders, Huns, Goths, Germans, other Celts and Franks, like all, all kinds of stuff. So they need a system of protection that the Roman Empire once provided. All right, so what is their system of protection? Feudalism. 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 All right, cool. So give me the hierarchy. Kings, Kings nobles, knights, knights artisans, serfs. serfs. All right, serfs or peasants. <clears throat> all right. The hell's a serf? Uh, slaves. Basically, basically slaves. Basically slaves. So what are they doing? They're, they're working, working for everybody else. The king, uh, and the stuff on the land. Okay, cool. So let's back up on that. What's what's their uh, chunk of land called? Manor. A manor, right? Sometimes feudalism is known as manorialism, right? So I've got my manor, my plot of land. I've got my king or my lord over here in the castle, and on this land, I've got serfs. They have the right to use that land, you know, for hunting or fishing or whatever. Uh, and what does that call you? You said it. Common. This is called, yeah, common land. <clears throat> so they have the right to use that land. But can these serfs, like, leave or? No. No, they're stuck there. The Lord uh, requires them to work. They pay for this right to use the land for their labor. Uh, that's called corvée labor. Basically, you pay in your labor. You pay taxes in your labor. All right. Did we, did we really have money in Europe back then? No. What was the main currency? Working. Oh, the grains. Yeah. yeah, the grains, uh, right? You get them from working. But yeah, the, the <coughs> grains, that was the pretty much what you would pay with. So these guys would farm. They would keep what they needed to, to survive, and the rest would go to who? The king. The king of the Lord, right, exactly. And they stockpile it. And so they're, they're benefiting from this, obviously. Uh, what, what service do they provide to these serfs who are working? Protection. 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 How? Um, if someone tries to invade, they'll protect them. Okay, they might pay other peasants or knights as like defenders. And what if there's like a famine or a drought? They do. Yeah, they stock up that food and they would dish that back out to them uh, for help, essentially. Right? So, these serfs and everyone below would swear an oath to obey in exchange for protection the people above them. What's that swearing of the oath called? BLT. BLT, yeah. Okay. And what do I call the people who are below me on this hierarchy? Vassals. Vassals, right. So who's a vassal for uh, the nobles? Nice. Right from below. What about the king? All. No. All, right. Vassals. All right. There's a complication, though. Um, why aren't the kings necessarily in power? Who do they depend on? Nobles. The nobles, right. Because the nobles agree, if the kings ask for help or taxes, they'll send it. But, if they don't like the king, could they just not do those things? Yeah. Yeah, and many times, if they team up and fight against the king and his own army, uh, and depose or get rid of him. Which you're fine, Julia. Uh, and get rid of him. Alright? So that's going to prevent really any major empire 
from emerging from Western Europe uh, because of feudalism. There are a couple attempts, though. Let's see ya. There are a couple attempts, though, and that'll be what we finish with. So, who's my first main attempt in the 800s to uh, form a, a large centralized empire? Charlemagne. Yeah, Charlemagne. I forgot to mention it in the notes, but his empire is called the Carolingian Empire. I know, I, I forgot to mention it, though. I know it was on the notes. Uh, 800s. And he conquers a lot of the kingdoms in France, northern Italy, and Germany. And people are like, oh, sweet. It's smaller, but it's kind of like Romish. Like, we're, we're, we're coming back to our glory days. Pope gets excited, goes and anoints him. Uh, anoints him what? Hold the Roman Emperor. And they come up with this kooky, terrible system where nine electors, I don't know if that's the original number, but nine electors, when he dies and passes on, elect a new Holy Roman Emperor, right? But that makes the position itself really vulnerable to what? Bribery, right. Bribery, right? So a lot of people are just not going to respect the position because it can just literally be bought if you're rich enough, and plenty of people do it, right? So elected, <clears throat> at least after Charlemagne, elected, and it, it's not going to be respected. And I've got hundreds of tiny little feudal kingdoms here in Germany and Italy, and uh, sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't. So I think you can uh, surmise that that's not a very good centralized government. A centralized government, there should be governors or satraps or whatever that listen and obey the laws and uh, work along with you. But this Holy Roman Empire, despite how long it lasts, never going to have that set up. All right, you're always going to have certain princes or kings or lords not listening or teaming up against the emperor or whatever, or not paying their taxes. So it's going to be a, a very nasty, unsuccessful system. All right. So that's not going to work, but we do start getting the modern identities uh, for three European countries. They're not entirely there yet, but they have kings, and they start developing a, a sense of identity based on common language. What are those three? Spain. France, Spain. England, Spain. And Spain. Spain. Right. So England, the 900s, they're starting to form what is going to be later England, France as well, the 900s, and lastly... Once they chase the Arabs out in the 1400s, uh, we're going to have Spain. And man, my voice is going out. So what a good time to end it. See you tomorrow. All right, let's start with the uh, civilization up here in Scandinavia that is actually before 1200, but it does establish a solid set of trade routes up here in Europe, which are relevant. Who are they? Vikings. 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 Yeah, there you go. Sure, I'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so all of a sudden, around the late eighth century, seven hundred or so, we have the Vikings, uh, and they're gonna be moving, uh, be it settling or invading and raiding. Uh, why all of a sudden in the late seven hundreds? There was a warming period. Yeah, we have a warming period. Okay, cool. From uh, I can't really exact year it starts. I believe it's just the eighth century to the fourteenth, but warming period. So that means uh, the Earth's a little bit warmer, so the summer's a little bit longer, and I can now farm further north and south, right? Because normally this would have been off limits, too cold, but with that warming period, they could farm up here. Viking population grew. There's not much room up there. It's mostly mountains. And uh, they need to move, so they do move, all right? So they are going to raid all in the Baltic Sea, the North Sea. In fact, they're going to discover some places too. What do they discover? America. Yeah, they go to Iceland first. Then there's already people there, by the way. And they go to Greenland. I think there were people in Greenland too, but there was, uh, oh, actually there's people in North America as well. But they discover what they call the Vinland, or the Vineland, and that is going to be um, uh, United, the Americas, uh, Newfoundland and Canada. All right, it's Leif Erikson. Okay, cool. So, but they don't stay, they come back. But we found Viking settlements, so we know they're there. But again, who cares about that? Well, we care about what the Vikings did uh, as far as establishing a. Um, more consolidated trade network and, and trade cities up there. Because we care about that because when the plague comes around, it's going to spread through that trade network. All right, so what advantage do the Vikings have that allowed them to explore and conquer so well as far as like going up rivers and stuff? They had long ships. Yeah, long ships. The Viking long ship, right. All right, and that was a very shallow ship and that was like, you know, it, was, it wasn't like a deep V, it was more like a, a, a wide U, which allowed them to uh, float in uh, shallower water so they could go up rivers. And they went up some crazy rivers. They went all the way down the Volga River. Uh, they went uh, down into what was like essentially the Byzantine Empire. 
uh, with the Slavic people. They invade up rivers into like Central Europe and Western Europe, and they're going to just invade everywhere they can, all the way to the Black Sea, to the point that the Byzantines hire them to fight and combat the Arabs and bodyguard the emperor, uh, because they were such fierce fighters. Uh, not that it's super relevant, but uh, why are they such fierce fighters? Because they don't care about them. Yeah, they weren't as concerned about not dying in battle because what was their way to get to heaven? To or die, uh, not die. heaven, but their Valhalla, their afterlife. Yeah, to die in battle. So they weren't as concerned with living. All right, that, that scared a lot of people. Plus they were taller than everybody too, so that, that added to it. All right, but again, their significance because they, they go from about 795 to about 1100 is when they stop doing their uh, large scale raids. They have a lot of internal strife, and also a lot of them convert to Christianity. Oh, speaking of which, what were they doing that really messed with the Europeans' minds uh, initially? They were destroying um, like churches and Yeah, they were going after like churches and cathedrals and monks, like unarmed people, which was weird to the Europeans because Europeans never did that because they're all Christians. So they believed like God would smite them or whatever. The Vikings would come in and they didn't care. They were pagan. They believed in like Thor and Odin and Loki and all that stuff, all the Marvel people. And uh, they uh, just killed the monks and took all the stuff. Uh, and the Christians were quite shocked when God didn't like strike them dead. The Christian God didn't strike them dead. Anyways, did that for a while. But they get largely converted in the 1100s, uh, and their raids largely stop at that point. Plus, the earth starts getting, well, not quite. It doesn't quite start getting cool yet, but it largely stops. But again, what is our significance here? Why do we care about this? Otherwise, we wouldn't learn about this. Uh, trade that causes fairly Okay, what they do is they establish a solid trade network in the north. They help establish it anyway. All right, so they're the ones that kind of connect all of these areas. They connect uh, the powerful city uh, state, trade city state. Uh, uh, you tell me actually, what's the city state right here? You got to know for the quiz? No garage, yes. Right, they connect the uh, Slavic peoples with the uh, Byzantine Empire. They uh, trade with, uh, I believe Vikings trade as far as Baghdad, or at least into Iraq. So they're, they connect the Mediterranean with, the, uh, uh, with Northern Europe, essentially. Right? And that's going to facilitate when the plague comes in and arrives in the harbors of the Byzantines and the Italians, it's going to just continue to spread throughout all of Europe. And the Vikings were a big, played a big role in establishing that. All right, But the biggest civilization that played a role in establishing trade networks that facilitated the spread of goods, including disease, that was a long sentence. Who were they in, the 12, in 1206, roughly, when they started? Mongols. Who, who though, specifically, I'll go with you. Who united all the Mongol tribes? Oh, yeah, Genghis Khan, okay, cool. So we have the Mongols. Uh, 1206 to 1368, something like that. Or 86, Thir late, mid to late uh, 14th century. All right, so Genghis Khan. He is going to unite the uh, pastoral nomadic tribes of Mongolia. Friendly, diplomatically. No, by force, right. By the way, how does he keep you in line? Like, he's going to conquer you whether you're a, an enemy Mongol tribe or later a Turkic tribe, and he's going to pretty much ensure that you're not going anywhere. How does he do that? He puts you in a regiment of strangers, and yep. if you try to escape, the whole regiment dies. Exactly. So those people are not going to let you leave because they'd all be dead if that happened. Okay, cool. So, Genghis Khan is going to unite the Mongol tribes. Again, they're pastoralists. What's a pastoralist? No, that's a nomad. Pastoralists are specific in that they, they do or their society functions a specific way. How do they survive? Yes, they move, but what are they moving with? What are they moving towards? Herds. herds, yes. They are going to be the ones that follow the herds to the grasslands and uh, river areas. That makes it particularly hard, by the way, for civilizations to go after them. Like if the Chinese are particularly perturbed at them, it's like, well, you can't just go to like their capital city because they don't have a capital city. They're just out there somewhere. If they want to attack the Chinese, though, they know exactly where the Chinese are because they have cities. All right, unites the Mongols and um, has a very efficient military. What was the major military advantage of the Mongols, by the way, that nobody could really beat for quite a while? Horseback archers. Yeah, horseback archers. Like a whole society based on them. Is that mine or yours? Okay. A whole society based on uh, cavalry archers. And nobody really knew how to beat that at the time. The only thing they could possibly do was, you know, have a walled city or a castle and be like, well, you can't get us here. That is true. But the Mongols could defeat them still. So, uh, cavalry archers. 
all right? And they invade into China. What dynasty are they invading into in the 1200s? Song Dynasty, right. And while, while Genghis Khan's not gonna actually conquer the entire Song, he's gonna take the northern half of it and start the what dynasty there? Yuan. Yuan, yeah. Or at least that will be started there later. <clears throat> and again, that is the uh, dynasty in China run by the Mongols. All right, so his son Ogde takes over later. They conquer quite a bit into uh, Central Asia. Uh, who's his son that takes, oh, I just said Ogde. Who was the uh, Khan, though, that's going to consolidate uh, China and rule it, uh, I guess I'd say, most uh, flawlessly? No, not flawlessly. He screwed up a bunch. He threw away a bunch of troops over here uh, to the uh, Mahjabit and, um, and Japan. Um, the grandson of Kublai Khan. Yeah, Kublai Khan, yep. That's the grandson, correct. Excellent. Okay. So there's the Mongols. Uh, they get into China. How do they, uh, before they get siege weapons, how do they get these Chinese cities to surrender? They starve them. Yeah, they, they starve, they, they can't really say they siege them initially because they didn't have siege weapons, but they certainly would just surround them and starve them. Any supporting army or supplies coming, they would just crush it. Um, and they had a couple tactics they would use. So first of all, they had the cavalry archers that were really hard to beat. But also they do this like hit and run thing where they attack you, and the battle looks like it's even, then all of a sudden they start retreating, you're like, oh, we won! And then they all chase after you, but it's not real. They just want to draw you away from your main force, and then they turn on you and kill you. Uh, and they kept doing this over and over and over to new civilizations, because they'd never seen it before. Or at least, they didn't know that's what they were going to do. All right, so they get into China, they defeat the uh, northern parts here, uh, slowly. What do they take from the Chinese that really helps them out elsewhere in the world? Yeah, they take the Chinese siege workers and weapons, uh, and they're going to uh, utilize those in Persia, near India, in Europe, in the Middle East, uh, all these locations they're going to be using them. Okay, so yeah, just generally tell me, if I'm conquered by the Mongols, what, how do, what do they do? Let's assume that I resisted them, right? I didn't just volunteer to join them. They put you as human shields, soldiers, just like... Oh yeah, they're brutal like that. If they're attacking, they're going to use your civilians to see human shields and throw plague bodies into your city, all that kind of stuff, okay. Uh, but what do they like do once they've taken over you? Plunder. Yeah, they plunder. Okay, cool. So they collect tribute, right? They take whatever they want, really. What other things do they take? Slaves. Yeah, slaves. That's a big one. Slave laborers, right? And do they take any military personnel or equipment? Some. Yeah, any technology. So give me an example of one. We recovered it, but I just want you to say it again. Siege worker. From? Chinese. Yeah, they do it for Persia, <clears throat> too. So Chinese slash Persian siege workers. Cool. They also kind of back end a, an old or a, a declining Turkic empire as they go through Central Asia. What empire was that? Seljuk. Yeah, following just the, uh, the Seljuks from a few hundred, uh, 150 years earlier or so. And uh, they're going to incorporate them too. So very quickly, they have a massive multi-thousand person force of Mongols, Turks, uh, and they also have some Chinese uh, and later Persian workers going along with them. So let's get a conquest chain here. So they take Central Asia, largely from the Turks. Okay, they got that. They got this region here. Uh, where else do they go? Persia. Yep, they get into Persia who resists them, unfortunately for Persia, because now they have siege weapons. Uh, so they pull the uh, Chinese siege workers over there and they help uh, to uh, break down uh, the Persian siege, uh, or forts rather. Get Persia, boom. All right, what else? Abbasid Caliphate. Yep, they do the same thing the Abbasid Caliphate, exactly, to resist them. And they're going to sack and destroy Baghdad in 1258, so down goes that. Uh, to the Indus River. Yeah, they go all the way to the Indus River, roughly, so into Pakistan. All right, they stop there for the most part. Uh, the yeah, they get out of Eastern Europe, all the Russians and Kievans and all that. So they get into uh, the Middle East. Right? They're going to actually be defeated by a combination of the Mamluks and the Byzantines, but uh, they're not really going to put much effort into that. Normally, if they lose a battle, they just come back with more and beat you anyway. Uh, but they don't come back after this one because they're so far extended. But we do get one branch that goes off and just annihilates Europe. Uh, they defeat the Russians, the Georgians, the Azerba um, Azer Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani. I don't even know what to call that group. The people of Azerbaijan. Uh, Armenians, Russians, the people of Kiev and Rus, the Polish Lithuanians, they even get into Hungary and knock out the Hungarians. They don't really control it, but they defeat their, uh, their armies there. 
and they look it back because they're quite far away. But of course, when they get back to Mongolia, they're like, hey, by the way, it's super weak over there. We should take it. Uh, and they actually do. So very quickly, the Mongols uh, are going to conquer. Like They have the biggest land empire for a very, very, very long time. They're going to have China. They're going to have Korea. They're going to have pretty much all of Central Asia. Uh, I don't think they get into Tibet. Don't quote me on that. I just don't know. Uh, Middle East, Persia, Central, the, the Caucasus region with like Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Eastern Europe, like they have a huge, 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 huge empire. So I realize they lose a battle here and they lose a couple other battles, but what really stops them from expanding? Uh, the Indonesian independence? You're right. That's a total failure, a complete failure by the part of Kublai Khan. You're referring to when they attempt to invade Japan twice by sea, but they have no idea what the hell they're doing. Uh, and they also try to, uh, because they don't pay tribute, and the, uh, the Mahajapit uh, Empire of Indo the Indonesian archipelago refused to pay tribute, so they try to invade them, lose their whole army again. But um, what, what happens in this empire that's going to really prevent them from spreading? Internal conflict. Yeah, internal conflict, because once uh, Genghis Khan and Ogden, they go, it's going to be, I mean, there's so many sons and grandsons, and they all want to be the great Khan. Uh, so they're all going to fight over one another. So initially, they break this massive empire up into four parts. What are those four parts? Okay, they're called Khanates. I should, I should write that up there. Ruled by a Khan. But again, everybody wants to be the great Khan. Nobody just wants to be a Khan. They want to be a great Khan. So let me put who they conquered real quick. So China, I'll put the Song, actually, dynasty. Song, not even the Northern Jin dynasty, but we'll just, who cares about that? Song dynasty. Uh, We'll put Central Asia, Persia, Abbasid Caliphate, uh, Eastern Europe, mostly just the Russians. All right, huge military, or sorry, huge empire very quickly. And uh, they break it up into four Khanates, right? And that's their uni unique government. So the Arabs have Caliphates and Sultanates. Uh, the uh, Muslims, or sorry, the uh, Mongols have Khanates. Ruled by a Khan. Oh, yeah. And this is much more like the Aztec Empire in that they largely let you continue ruling. You just have to provide a steady supply of tribute slash slaves slash workers and allow the use of your military. Otherwise, they come back and stomp you again. All right. What are my four conates? Well, I got this one, this one, and these two. It's that one. Great. 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 That one. Chagatai. Chagatai, yeah. That one. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Golden Lord. Golden Lord. Lord. And those are gonna maintain themselves for a while. And even though the, the Mongols were like, <laughs> killed like the most people since, uh, all the way up to basically World War I and later Hitler and Stalin, what good things did they do? Spread Sort of what? Spread technology. Okay, but how? Let's get to the how first. You're right, eventually technology and ideas are gonna spread, but how, what's allowing that to happen? They re reinvigorate trade. Yeah, they reinvigorate trade, especially which trade route? The Silk Road, right. So the Silk Road is going to be reestablished, or the system of roads that is the Silk Road. All right, that's going to be established. Uh, and you know, the trade network's going to pick up just because there's going to be more activity in general. Same with the Mediterranean. Um, I'm not quite sure about the trans saharan but uh, <clears throat> that trade's going to be reinvigorated. So China is not going to have a direct link with the West, which they haven't had for a while. They've been connected with the uh, Indian Ocean through the Song Dynasty, but now it's just straight China. Uh, to uh, the Mediterranean and Europe. So, what are some technologies that are going to trickle from uh, China to uh, Europe, for example? Paper money. Yeah, I should forgot about that. Silk Road reinvigorated. Yep, and then we get tech spreading from China. So, yes, what did you say? What was your uh, example? Uh, paper money. Paper money from the Tang Dynasty and Song. What else? What? Printing technology. Yeah, printing. Nice. Printing technology. That's going to get to Europe eventually through the caliphates into Spain, uh, and they're going to develop the printing press, which is going to change the entire world. Gunpowder. Gunpowder, yes. Not weaponized yet, but when the Europeans get it, they're going to figure it out. Uh, there's a couple of navigational things. Compass. Yeah, compass and astrolabe. Those are both going to greatly help out. Actually, the astrolabe, I think, was a was a, a Muslim invention, but the compass for sure comes from China. So I'll put compass for now. All right. So those technologies are going to get to Europe, who at the time is not really learning anything. 
because they've forgotten how to learn. What was that old Greek idea where they're supposed to uh, uh, doubt things and try to find them out? Oh, science logic, yeah. So Greco-Roman logic has disappeared. And why aren't people allowed to go to try to find answers on their own? What's constricting them? I think I told you this. Maybe I didn't. The church. Yeah, the Catholic Church has got a tight grip on that. All right, but the arrival of these new things is going to start the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation, and certain areas of Europe are going to be much more relaxed, and they're going to allow them basically to think about, read about, and invent things, and that's going to really, really transform Europe. All right, that's the Mongols. Last one, the bad thing that they're going to spread that just kills millions of people. Yeah, what disease specifically? Black Plague. The Black Death, right. That originated in China. It's going to make its way across into the Mediterranean, then back around through Europe, those trade routes established by the Vikings, and it's going to just decimate people. So we have the Black Death in the 13th, sorry, the 14th century. All right, so a third of Europe dies. And depending on the area, you get 30 to 90% of people are dying. Uh, are the fatalities higher in, I just make it sound like a video game, fatality. Uh, are the fatalities higher in um, cities or rural? Cities. cities. Right, because they're close together, share sanitation, all that crap. So it's going to do particularly bad in uh, port cities, right? And that is going to be spread by the fleas on rats. And the Europeans are going to make the mistake of thinking the cats are doing it, and then they kill the cats, which are killing the rats. That means there's more rats and more fleas, so they make it worse. Good job, guys. All right. So other than everybody dying, not everybody, but a lot of people dying, what are my uh, cultural and economic impacts here? How does this affect literature and art and things like that? Uh, there's an apocalyptic tone. Yeah, that's from the notes. What does that mean? Apocalyptic tone. Uh, art basically starts to focus on death and despair. Yeah. Literature and art are going to focus a lot more on death, despair, short lives, etc. Okay, cool. So, all right, we'll put that apocalyptic tone. As long as you know what that means. All right, so art, literature, death-centered, or short life-centered, or misery, despair-centered. Okay, cool. What about economically? So the labor shortage? Yeah, why is there labor shortage? Because the, the workers died. Okay, but I mean, half the people would want stuff, though. Why do they want more things than they wanted before? Because they would need more people to make things. Why do they, why they need to make more things? So you remember this problem? Okay, so... There's only one way to increase living standards in a short term, meaning everybody has more stuff. That's kill half the people, right? So that's what happens here. A third and half the people die. That stuff doesn't disappear. That stuff goes to the leftover people, so their living standards go up. So they're doing a little better, right? So actually, we'll put that living standards up, other than the worrying about death part. They have more stuff because half the people die, and so then they get their stuff. So that creates a new problem. They have money to spend. Yeah, now they got more money to spend on stuff, so they need more things to make. But the only problem is half the people are dead, so there's no one to make it, right? So we have a labor shortage, which is good for workers or bad? Good. Good, good yeah, because they can negotiate for higher wages. Like, oh, you need me to work for you? Oh, I don't want to work. Oh, you really need me to work for you? Well, you got to pay me a lot. Uh, so that's how it's going to go. All right, and then also women get a chance to work if they want to. All right. Cool. That's the impact of the Black Death and the Mongols and the Vikings. So again, these two, even though this precedes 1200, obviously, these two are going to establish uh, and consolidate the trade networks that are later going to spread this disastrous Black Death, All right, which we can now treat with a pill, antibiotics. Ta-da! But back then, you done ski. Got it? All right, let me get a quick squirt of water here. All right, let's uh, do African and Southeast Asian <clears throat> states. We'll do Africans first. So who do I have uh, referring to, not really an empire, but at least a developing civilization, right? Yeah. Okay, you're right, Ghana and Mali, but besides Ghana and Mali. Yeah, Hausa kingdoms, Hausa land, yeah. There we go. Actually, I should probably write this up here for the internet people, which might be you, actually, pretty soon. Hope you wrote all that. I mean, you don't have to. But. Okay, so African kingdoms. So we have from uh, like a thousand-ish BCE, sorry, CE to, um, oh, when did they get kicked out? They got booted out by 
a sultanate in the 1800s, I think. Yeah. So we'll say the 19th century. That doesn't look very nice. We'll put 1800s. There we go. Uh, their peak's going to be like the 15th to 18th century, but regardless, these are uh, the Hausa kingdoms. And uh, they're going to really benefit from a particular trade network and connection with a particular civilization. What are those two answers that I'm asking questions to? Let's go with somebody else. You guys have answered plenty. Let's go with a silent person who's afraid of being wrong. You're not a silent person who's afraid of being wrong, but you haven't answered very many, so okay. Uh, Sub-Saharan? Yeah. yeah, okay, so the Trans-Saharan Trade Network, right? Which at the time was just going this way, but oh, now it can go this way. So why can it go this way now? Because of the caravan. Yes, so the Arabs are going to domesticate camels, which can travel across the desert much more easily, and uh, travel in caravans, which are groups that make it easier to carry supplies and survive this trek across the desert. Cool. So. Uh, Arabs are going to connect, and that is thanks to, of course, camels and caravans. Excellent. And uh, how are these, uh, how is that going to benefit uh, the West African kingdoms, including the uh, Hausa? Need a cricket sound. I can't make one or I would. You get the idea from the higher ups to like get a centralized government. Okay, they do borrow a lot of ideas from the Arabs, so they are going to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not borrow, but knowledge but borrow. They're going to uh, borrow the Arab, or at least the general Arab administration uh, program. All right, so they're going to start what looks more like a centralized government or empire. And who the Arabs learn that from, by the way? Persians. Persians, right. Well, who knows that one? <clears throat> All right. But what's going to really benefit these guys over here? Like, that they're going to, their kingdoms are going to grow and become more economically powerful. Why? What? Trade with who? Okay. Which state or states? In a thousand. In the year 1000. Who's up here? Abbasid. There you go. Abbasid Caliphate or other associated sultanates. All right, so they're going to connect with caliphates. And do the caliphates have some money? Yes. Do they have some trade goods? Yeah. Why? Remind me. Yeah, they're at least connected to all the major inter-regional inter trade networks at that time. Exactly. Okay, cool. So that's big money for them. And what's their primary um, uh, trade city? Not to book two, don't say it, but Keno, yeah. Keno, and then um, they're going to convert to what and why? Islam. Islam, Islam because? Trade yeah, they want that, that good relationship and trade benefits with the uh, Arab Caliphates. Trade benefits. So they got things like gold and ivory. And actually, ivory is more of an East African thing. Gold and copper, salt, and one other thing that's not something you can mine that they're going to have a lot of in West Africa. Nope. Slaves. Slaves. This is where the slave trades begin. The slave trade starts way before the Portuguese in as early as 1000 CE with the Arabs. Because remember, these African kingdoms would fight, and they would just take slaves. Uh, and the Arabs got there, and they're like, hey, we'll, we'll take some of those. And so they would just essentially buy them. Uh, so that West African slave trade was an ongoing thing since as, as early back, at least uh, on a large scale, as 1000 CE. All right, cool. So, yeah, that's good for the House of Kingdoms. What's uh, what's down here? The one, the one civilization. Great Zimbabwe. Great Zimbabwe. Cool. All right, and that's going to be from like 1100-ish to about 1450. There's not a whole lot that's super relevant about this. They were one of the only walled uh, civilizations down there in the sort of Bantu-ish regions. Um, but what is significant is they're at the very tail end of a major, major trade network. So I want to know what that is and how we know it. Yeah, they found a couple Chinese goods there. Yeah, so they're going to be uh, tail end of Indian Ocean trade network. 
right? And they do find a couple of Chinese goods there, cool. Um, and they are a walled city. There are several of those small walled cities there, but they exist. So what's gonna cause a decline then, if they're doing so well for 350 years? They ran out of gold in their mines. Okay, they believe that perhaps the access to gold was had declined, okay? So gold mines decline. Lack of trade down there. Yeah, and there's gonna be way more trade up north, especially when uh, these get established. We'll get to those when we get to the city states. Um, actually, we'll just do it now. Who's here that's gonna develop a, a much more complex and active trade network up there on the Swahili Yeah, the Swahili city states. Okay, so let, let's put end fall due to gold mine exhaustion and um, trade up north. They basically like, <laughs> It's like building a, that and now they're building on the road by the freeway. It's like, instead of building by the freeway, you build over by itself with a river. It's like, ah, it's not gonna get nearly as much business. All right, so, um, yeah, this one, Swahili city states, already said it, honey, to ask that. I'd be impressed if you remember this, because I just told you this today. City states, all right. This is a mix of two different ethnic, ethnic groups slash languages. What is that going to be? It's all the same people, but that's fine. Uh, Arabs and Bantu. Yeah, Arabs and Bantu, right. The Bantu are like basically all over here. And the Arabs, of course, are gonna come down there. So it's gonna be Arab plus Bantu. Oh, I forgot to mention this today during the lecture. Uh, what's that wind sequence that's gonna bring ships to and from that region easily? Monsoon, Monsoon winds, yeah. So that's gonna help them out. And why does this area become Islamic for the most part over here on this coast? To uh, take advantage of the trade networks. Okay, they want trade networks benefits with the Muslims, but which Muslims are there? How are they there? What is that? Muslim diaspora Yes, it was the Muslim merchant diaspora. So you had Arab merchants settling on these trade cities, building mosques, and of course encouraged people around them who really wanted to trade with them. Uh, in these Swahili city-states uh, to convert to Islam. Were these city-states like an empire? No. no, they're a bunch of independent city-states for the most part. So they do, uh, they are a part of the Muslim diaspora, which again just means, especially for the internet, it just means you're from one location where there's a lot of you and you disperse and settle uh, in small groups outside of it. Diaspora. Nice, and then, uh, yeah, city-states, not a, an empire. All right. We're forgetting out. Oh, that's right. Very close to this, though, in what is considered Ethiopia now, also known, at least part of it, as Eritrea, and then also called Abyssinia. Uh, what dynasty is going to establish itself here in like 1290 or whatever? So we have the Zagwe uh, uh, Empire, but this one's the one that lasts for like 700 years. Solomonic, Solomonic dynasty, yeah. Solomonic dynasty in what is now Ethiopia. That's going to go from about 1290 to 1974. It's got a long stretch there. Uh, Islamic? No. No, what are they? Christian. Christian, yeah. It's a Christian kingdom, a lone Christian kingdom. And they're going to actually hold out for quite a while. They're surrounded by uh, hostile sultanates uh, in Muslim states, but they're going to hold out for a while. And they actually get some help later in the 1500s when somebody shows up and provides them with guns and troops to help fight off uh, neighboring sultanates. Portuguese. Yeah, the Portuguese, right. So in 1500, they received support from the Portuguese. The uh, Europeans were happy to find them because they had like this legend of this lost Christian kingdom, you know, uh, across the sea or whatever. So when they found this, they're like, there it is. Um, but uh, they really just ended up helping it out as far as uh, staying independent. And they actually stay independent all the way through the age of imperialism, which we'll get to later. So yay, Solomonic. By the way, it was called that because he thought, the leader thought he had ancestry going all the way back to King Solomon of Israel. So it was a pretty long one. Okay, got that? Yeah. Sweet, so that's here, here, here. What else did we have? Southeast Asia, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Southeast Asia. What are my two Southeast Asian uh, Indian archipelago empires. They'll go first and then second. Shribahaya. Yeah, Shribahaya. And Mahabharata. Yeah, Maha. Yeah, I'm spelling that wrong, I'm sure. But that's cool. Okay, so Shribaya Jaya. Shriba Jaya is going to be like 8th century ish, which is 700s to about, uh, what was the year? 
1060 or something like that. Let me double check. Maybe it was, maybe it was 1200 actually. I wrote the year down because I knew I'd forget. No, I did. 1290. 1290. So about 700 to 1290. All right. And they're going to be mostly a what type of, uh, uh, re religiously, what type of estate? Buddhist. Buddhist initially. Because that's going to spread from uh, be a trade in the Indian Ocean. Okay. And uh, what's their major trade city going to be that's organized onto a, on a choke point, so everyone's got to go buy it and trade and buy it from there? Malacca. Yeah, Malacca. That's going to be a powerful city-state. And again, why? Oh, no, we'll get to that later. We'll, we'll come back to that. All right, that's their main trade, trade city-state. And they're going to spread a bunch of their people throughout the Indian Ocean over here. They're going to have their own, like, mini-diaspora of merchants. What type of people are they? I just told you this one today. They're not Muslim. They're not Chinese. Singapore is over here. Okay, I'll give you a hint. This is Malaysia. Malay. Malay people, yeah, there you go. Unfortunately for them, though, from the uh, island of Java, Java, sorry, they're going to be essentially pushed out, right? They're a maritime empire based by sea and trade. So are these guys, though. And these guys are going to run. They're going to push them out from 1290 to 1500. Uh, they are also going to be initially Buddhist. But both of these regions are going to peacefully convert to what? Hinduism. Nope, not Hinduism. Islam. Islam, why? Yeah, but who? How? Muslim diaspora. Yeah, that, that Muslim merchant diaspora. Same thing. So this whole region is going to convert to Islam uh, by, uh, by peacefully, essentially. And this is, by the way, the last major empire in that region, uh, as far as indigenous empires go. Uh, the Europeans are going to show up in 1800s, sorry, the 1500s, and they're going to start taking over things, the Portuguese and the Dutch and the British. But uh, that's the last like, major empire of the uh, Indian archipelago. In fact, they're actually famous for defeating one uh, very, very tough-to-beat empire. Mongols. Yeah, the Mongols, the Yuan Dynasty. Cool. That's those two. Got two more in the region, though, on the mainland, the peninsula in Southeast Asia. The Khmer and the Chong. Yep. So which one is modern-day Thailand and Cambodia, and which one is, like, southern central Vietnam? Khmer is central. Is what? Is modern-day Vietnam, sorry. Nope. <clears throat> Chompa is south of Vietnam. Yep, so we got the Chompa Empire in what is now uh, central and southern Vietnam. And we have in uh, modern day Cambodian Thailand, the Khmer Empire. Oops, misspelled that one. All right, Khmer are like 800-ish um, to 1300-ish. Champa is going to be significantly longer. I can't remember their, their start. I think they were like a really early start. It might be like the 200s or something like that. I wrote it down because I knew I wouldn't remember if I could find it. And I cannot find it. Yeah, so it is the second century, so it's actually the 100s. All right, so we'll say uh, 100, and they go for quite a while. They go to 18, like 32 or something. That's a pretty long-standing empire. All right, what two religions dominate this region? Hinduism. Hinduism and Buddhism. All right, which one is going to be adopted more so by the upper class and which so much more by the lower classes, and why? Hinduism was by upper class yep. because... Because, because it enforced the hierarchy. Right, the caste system enforced the hierarchy. <laughs> Excellent. And Buddhism? And Buddhism was because it kind of accepted everyone. Like, yeah, it was, it was open to all. It was egalitarian. Cool. That's Buddhism. And uh, it's going to be the same story here in the Khmer Empire for the most part. So what I want to know then is what are the three reasons that uh, <laughs> these rulers are going to adopt Hinduism in that era, area? It enforced the hierarchy. It enforced the hierarchy, of course. It said I should be in my position because I'm such a good person, or I was in my last life. Okay. And they um, also like the culture, how it's like. You know, yeah, there wasn't really much of a unified culture over there. Those were new empires and civilizations, but India had been around for like 3,000 years or so, so they were willing to adopt a prestigious and ancient civilization's customs. They like the deities. Yeah, they like the deities. Which ones? Shiva and Vishnu. Yep, cool. So, caste system enforced. The hierarchy, they uh, admired Indian culture, and also they admired the uh, uh, deities, such as the Shiva and Vishnu. Cool. Uh, what was the Khmer Empire? 
particularly famous for. Both of them had cool architecture, but Hindu architecture and Buddhist statues. But like, what was the main thing, the huge thing that was the biggest at its time? Angkor. Angkor Wat, yeah. At its time, the biggest city from 1100 to about 1300. Then it was abandoned. We don't know why. All right. Cool, those are those empires. And is that all the states? Now it's just the Inca, Aztec, and the trade city-states, right? Yeah. All right, cool. Let's uh, bust them out and get on out of here. We'll do the Aztec, and then we'll do the Inca. We'll do both of them pretty quick. And then the city-states, and out we go. All right. Aztec and Mesoamerica, where am I uh, Inca at? South America. Yeah, where? The uh, western half. Of, what, um, what region is this? Mountains. Andes Mountains. Andes Mountains, yeah. Nice. Alright, where did the uh, Inca originate from? What like main city? Cusco. Cusco, yeah. Alright. Where did the Aztec uh, right hand hail from? Southern Yeah, they invaded in Mesoamerica. So we got the Aztec, we got the Inca. And both these guys are gonna operate roughly from 1300-ish to about 1500-ish when they get wiped out by the Spanish. All right, I think actually even a little less than that, I think. I think they actually started in the 1400s, but don't quote me. Okay, Aztec, give me some uh, defining features like uh, who ruled them and how? Was this one centralized government or what was it? Three city states. Yeah, it was three city states. Uh, but in the end, it really just became Tenochtitlan. All right. And uh, they conquered people, and they spread trade and stuff, which is cool, but they were particularly brutal when they conquered you. They were very militaristic. Give me some qualities that were not so nice. Human sacrifice. Yeah, they had a lot of human sacrifice, like thousands and thousands and thousands. They believed they had to to uh, not end the world for the most part. All right, so human sacrifice is a big part of it. They didn't, nope. People didn't like that when you took their kids and family members for sacrifice. What else did they take or collect? Slaves and tribute. Slaves and tribute. All right. And they are responsible for the spread of culture and trade and things like, you know, ball sports and all that. Uh, but no one's going to miss them when they're gone in the region. So somebody shows up and brings smallpox inadvertently and wipes them out. Who is that? And why are people so willing to join them to overthrow the Aztec, which they do? The Spanish. And yep. People are so willing to them because they to overthrow the Aztecs. Yep. So it's the Spain, Spanish plus uh, the, uh, I guess say, American Indian allies. And they are willing to do that because they really, really detest the Aztec because of how brutal they were. All right. So, I wanted to say something else about it, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, who was the last main ruler of uh, the Aztec Empire in Tenochtitlan? Lost in the second, yeah. Excellent. All right, down to the Inca. This, this is a first wave empire. Like, they're not centralized. They leave your local rulers in place, right? They just force you to pay tribute or they come back and whack you again. This is a second wave empire, though. What are they more like? Centralized. Yep, they're centralized, meaning? Uh, they set up governors, cities, roads. Yeah, governors, cities, roads, etc. They're much more interconnected and um, organized, absolutely. Centralized. They got roads, local officials. In fact, they're so organized, they have their own state run economy called what? The Mita system. The Mita system. What is the Mita system? It's like socialists and the government controls the jobs and what, what they do. Yep, they store the stuff, pay you, tell you what to make, etc. Uh, and they, uh, they use it effectively, at least as far as we know, uh, in that area. And there, this is a state-run economy. If you want to do anything on your own, you have to do it on your own at home. And um, they're able to build some pretty crazy things uh, pretty quickly. What was that sun god temple? Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu, right. So they built a giant temple of the sun god in the, in the very high up in the Andes Mountains. Sun god temple. But they lack some things, which makes it all the more impressive. What do they lack that would normally enable people to work and organize themselves well. Wheels and domesticated animals. Wheels and domesticated animals, right? But what, what about the communication? Because they kept records somehow. What did they lack and what did they have instead? 
Yeah, so they lacked knots, but they had um, these things called huipos, which are like uh, knots to keep track, to keep records. All right, but no wheel language, or written language, I should say, and no domesticated animals, other than llamas, but they can't really haul anything. Okay, <clears throat> and last part about the Incans, what two things caused their fall? Spanish disease. Yeah, Spain slash disease and... Internal conflict. Yeah, civil war. That'll do you in pretty quick. So they, they hold out to like, I think the last stronghold fell in like 1572 or something. All right, cool. That's the major civilizations. Now let's just do the trade cities of Wydunski. All right. <clears throat> So, I'll have you identify them now. So, for the Empire of Mali, I've got Timbuktu. Uh, for the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, I have Baghdad. Baghdad. Yeah. For the Italian city-state that is a maritime force, I have Venice. Venice. Nice. For the northern European Baltic coast city that is enriched by Viking trade, I have Novgorod. Mm, for the West Indian city-state that is going to be enriched by the Delhi Sultanate, I have Calicut. Oh yeah, Calicut. Yeah. We'll just say Calicut, though. We're going to talk about Malacca. That's a check. Yeah, nice. We're going to discuss them. Um... In the south of China, connected with the Great Canal, or the Grand Canal, with the north and central of China, I have the major trade city called, this would be impressive to remember this one, Hongzhou, yeah, nice. It's not an easy one to remember. What am I skipping? I'm skipping a couple. Oh, yeah, the Central Asian one. Uh, in former Persia, conquered by the Greeks, and then the Persians, and the Mongols, and the Persians again, I have... Uh, nope. Samarkand. Samarkand. Nice. And in Central Asia, conquered by the Chinese, Turks, Mongols, Chinese, Caliphates, yeah, Kashgar. All right, cool. So we'll talk about these ones we just, you just know about. I just described basically what they were. Uh, these ones just already discussed. These two, we've got to cover, oh, that one I discussed largely. Tip book two. Which empire is that connected to? Mali. Mali. What's going to enrich them? Trade with who? Yeah, yeah the caliphates. What religion are they going to be? Islamic. Yeah, Islamic. Don't pack up yet. Islamic. All right. Timbuktu. Oh, real quick before I forget. All of these city-states at roughly the same time, so not the Aztec and Let me get that away so it's not confusing. At roughly the same time, at, at around 1,000 CE, they're going to pop up and become incredibly wealthy and powerful. Why then? What's going on? The Vikings uh, reinvigorated the trade routes and stuff. Okay, that's one trade route, yeah. So this whole Mediterranean and, North, uh, and Northern European trade network is going to be reinvigorated by the Vikings. Cool. Why else? The Mongols. The Mongols are going to start up what? Silk Road. Silk Road starts back up again. So Mongols. What else? Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean Trade Network, what's going to be contributing to that? The Swahili and... Okay, Swahili and the monsoon winds. Indian Ocean, Delhi Sultanate. Delhi Sultanate. Yeah, the Indian Archipelago ones, Shrivaya, Shrivi, Ja, Jaya, man, I can't say it myself. And the Majapit. Okay, and then who's here that's connected to all of them? Abbasid. Yeah, the caliphates, Abbasid this time. So because there's these large empires that have wealth that are trading, uh, they're going to be going through these city-states and uh, benefiting from that wealth. Excellent. So which one of these is known for establishing trade contacts as well as forming a powerful navy and being the middlemen, it's going to give it away, between Europe and uh, the, uh, the caliphates and the Byzantines? Venice. Venice, yes. They're also going to invent banking, so banks to store your money. They're going to form contracts as middlemen. And remember, what's a middleman? Transportation. Yeah, you pay them for the transportation. That's the UPS guy that delivers your Amazon package. He's the middleman. All right, and you pay him for it. All right. Um, oh, and a large navy. 
that are going to control uh, the Mediterranean Sea. All right, which one of these is um, a result of its location on the Silk Road? And it was also one of the oldest civilizations ever. The Persians controlled it, the ancient Greeks controlled it, uh, and it's now a big center for Islam. Samarkand? Yeah. What kind of people are here? Uh, They're Sogdian. <laughs> yeah, Sogdian merchants, and they are pretty damn ancient. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, cities, and they, are, of course, are enriched by this Silk Road. Who else is enriched by the Silk Road? Kashgar. Kashgar. And while they are going to be conquered by many, many peoples, they do have that central position on those major trade routes. So when trade is doing well, like it's doing in the roughly 11th century to, I don't know, 14th century, they're going to do really well. I feel like I'm forgetting one. I don't think I am. Bye. All right, so let's start with the Aztec. They're coming in. From where? Yeah, it was now like the South United States to the Central American and American region. Uh, they run in the, uh, from the exact years, but it's basically the 15th century uh, to the uh, 16th century, like 1520-ish when the Spanish finished their conquest. All right. So, the Aztec. Is it one centralized government? No. What is it? Three city-states. Yeah, it's confederation of three city-states, right? The head one ends up being Tenochtitlan. All right, so we'll just we'll keep it that for now. But it is three city-states, and uh, it is not a second-wave empire. They're not centralized. When they take people over, like other Mayans or other people in the Mesoamerican region, um, what do they do? Yeah, they force tribute. Take, take slaves take and sacrifice. yeah, a lot of human sacrifice, right? So they are not friendly when they take over you. All right, so slaves, they force you to pay tribute, and of course they have their whole fun human sacrifice thing going on, uh, which causes people that are taken over to not like them very much. Um, in fact, a lot. Okay, and uh, who do they leave in charge? Do they put Aztec people in charge? These other city states they take over? These mine places? No. 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 Yeah, they leave them in charge. So they got to pay tributes, and if they don't, they come wreck up their city again. But yeah, they have to. They're required to provide soldiers or tribute payments or whatever whenever they're asked, or they'll get smashed again. All right, cool. So the Aztec are not making any friends over there. <clears throat> All right. Culturally, they do um, just like the Mongols. Even though they're terrible, terrible, terrible people, as far as how they treat people they conquer, um, they are going to uh, spread trade and cultural ideas and things like that. So. You do see an increase in trade in the region with the Mayans and the other Aztec and other uh, tribes in the region. But again, overall, it's pretty bad for most people, which is why when the Spanish show up, uh, people have no problem um, rising up against them. So who's the uh, last great Aztec king before that kingdom falls? Montezuma II. Yeah, Montezuma II. <clears throat> All right, and again, uh, they do have several hundred thousand people in their empire. Uh, they do enhance trade and all those good things, and they facilitate the spread of uh, culture in the Mesoamerican region. But again, not well liked. Spanish show up. What immediately wipes out a whole bunch of them unintentionally? Yeah, smallpox. yeah, with smallpox. Right, cool. So European diseases are going to just absolutely annihilate all of the uh, uh, peoples of the Americas, all the American Indians. Uh, European disease is going to decimate them. So measles, smallpox, things that still kill. People in the old world, but at a much, much, much reduced rate. Uh, it's more often that people will survive these. No immunities over here, though. They've never seen these diseases, so they just get wrecked uh, population-wise. Like upwards of 90% um, that are coming in contact with it. Okay, that weakens them. But also, the Spanish, even though there are a very small amount of them, uh, they're able to uh, raise up an oppositionary a resistance force against the Aztec. Quickly tell me why they're able to do that. Because everybody hated them, and so they were like... Yeah, everyone hated being ruled by them in the first place, so drawing up allies against them was not hard to do. All right, so as a result, uh, the Aztec are going to fall uh, to the Spanish and their Native American allies, or American Indian allies. <clears throat> cool, that's the Aztec. They're one of only two major state systems in the Americas uh, pre-Columbus. What was the other one? The Inca. Yeah, the Inca. Where are they at? Uh, yeah, the Andes Mountain region. Coming out of what main city state? Cusco. That's right. Emperor Guru. Inca. They're about the same time span. 
like early 15th to actually a little later. They hold out uh, to like 1572 or something. I think they're 1428 to 1572. Regardless, if you just want to throw on 15th, 16th centuries, that's good enough. All right, so they're also going to exp uh, expand via conquest, but their state system and administration was a bit more impressive. They were much more, they were much more similar to the old classical empires of the uh, of the old world. How so were they similar? Second wave centralized. Yeah, meaning what? Uh, they had a local ad administrators mm -hmm. all over their empire. Excellent. So you've got a central authority in Cusco, um, but they have like local administrators, uh, and they're going to uh, have road networks, just like the Romans did, and the Persians did, what the Chinese did. Um, they're also going to written language, right? No. No, they actually don't, which just makes this all the more impressive. So, centralized government and officials, they of course have roads, but they got no written language. But they still keep records, so they got roads, Mail. No, sorry, not mail, my bad. But they have records. And how are they keeping these records of death certificates and own what people own and what, what wages there and all that stuff? Uh, yeah, the Kipo Knot system. That was one major handicap that the uh, Inca were able to overcome. No written language, but they still kept records with those knots. What was the other major handicap that they had? No we no yeah, no wheels or domestic animals to pull stuff with. Llamas are not very good for hauling. So, did I turn this on? Okay, good. <clears throat> Llamas are not very good for hauling. So it's, it's all human labor, no wheel, no written language, and the Inca still are going to expand a massive empire and build a lot of uh, monumental structures. So, let's write that. Oh wait, no, we're not writing anything. What I wanted to ask was, how do they organize the labor then to build all these things so quickly? Yeah, which is what? Yeah, Somebody else tell me. Uh, they pick their jobs for the people. Who's they? Uh, the government. Yes, the state is going to uh, d dictate your job and your wage. Um, we don't know how much people liked or disliked it because they have no written records. But anytime in human society you force people to do something, it tends not to be liked. Um, what was the only way people could actually do stuff they wanted to do? They had to make it at home. Yeah, they'd privately make it at home. Nonetheless, it's going to work, so it's called the Mita system. Is that co coerced labor? What the hell is coerced labor? Forced. Yeah, it's basically forced, right? So like, I mean, it's like when someone, it's like when you pin your little brother and you know, you've got their arm behind their, you their arm behind their back and you're telling them to say uncle or whatever, like that's coercion, right? You're, you're essentially forcing them. So that's coerced labor, but it's gonna work. Uh, it's gonna get the job done technically. So that's a state run economy. Uh, they dictate your job, your hours, your wages, all those things. Okay, cool. What's an example of something cool they built, though? Machu Picchu. Yeah, the temple of the sun god, the sun king, right. Okay, cool. So they built a large temple of the sun god, a.k.a. Machu Picchu. All right, cool. And they're going to stretch from parts of modern-day Chile all the way up to, like, uh, Ecuador region. So that is the biggest, uh, largest, and most organized Network and empire in the Americas uh, pre-Columbus. So impressive, well done. What leaves them vulnerable though to uh, conquest by the Spanish later? I think it was Pizarro that did it. Civil war and internal conflicts. That's the same thing, but yes. So civil war and yeah, diseases again, right? Because it's a very low amount of Spanish, but they're able to pit other <coughs> Incans against another, or one Incans against one another because uh, there's a civil war going on and the Spanish disease, again, unintentional, but beneficial for the Spanish. So their fall is gonna be Spanish conquest, and that's gonna be due to disease and um, civil war. Lucky timing by the conquistadors. Good luck with them in period, uh, period two. All right, any questions about the Inca? Onward. So we'll talk now about some trade city states. So I've got, well, I'll put a bunch of dots up. You can tell me what they are. Wait for me to put them up first. This is a bad one. Yeah. Is that all of them? 
Oh, they're not a city though, but yes. We already talked about them on the last one anyway, so. I think that's enough, that's good enough anyway. Oh yeah, 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 thanks. I did this one, but yeah, there's actually multiple here. All right, cool, that was what I was forgetting. Sweet. Uh, Timbo, two. Timbo, two. Cover that one, but just just have it up there. And then these ones here. What's Swahili? What? Bantu and Arabs. Yeah. Okay. Bound on. Summer Clan. Yeah. And? Cool. All right, so the question I want to ask is, this, these cities all become incredibly wealthy and powerful. I mean, this is an imperial capital of the absent caliphate. But the rest, just to make sure, are not capitals. They're mostly semi-independent cities. All right, this one's definitely part of the Song Dynasty. But for the most part, these are, and this is definitely part of the uh, Tribhijaya and... Uh, Mahajapit, but they're pretty much going to be independent, powerful city states. So, what I want to know is why, from roughly 1000 to 1300 ish CE, I've got such powerful trade cities. Why so strong? We'll talk about each one momentarily, but why, in general, are these going to pop up and be so wealthy and powerful for a few centuries? Why are the trade systems coming back up again? What does that mean? They're reinvigorated. Okay, so they're 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 increasing in their volume of trade. All right. So I want to know a why. Foreign period and Mongols. Okay, that's okay. That's two specific reasons. Sweet. So I do have a warming period. That is true. Uh, petering out in this in this time. So I do have a population increase. But uh, Mongol Empire is a specific answer to a uh, much more broad development. So yes, the Mongol Empire, it's massive. I mean, look, it's got most of the cities right there within it, at least at one point. What else, though, is popping up besides the Mongol Empire, or is already there? Vikings. OK, yeah, I got Vikings enhancing trade up here in, in uh, Europe and Mediterranean. Absolutely. That's going to help spark Venice and Novgorod. Absolutely. What else? Uh, caliphates. Yeah, the caliphates, absolutely. They're going <coughs> to spur trade pretty much everywhere for the most part, right? Mahabhajit. Yeah, Mahabhajit Empire, absolutely. A little maritime trade there. And before them, the, the Shrivijaya, all right? Those are new ones that I have trouble with pronouncing, but nonetheless. So, what, uh, is that all my empires? If we can do more than that. Delhi Sultan. Yeah, okay, Delhi Sultanate. So Delhi, Mongol, Caliphates, Vikings. Remember that Vikings aren't an empire though, they're just a bunch of independent merchants and invaders. Uh, we got Mahajapahit. The uh, Mali. Mali, okay, cool. Song guys. Yeah, song. That's good enough. All right, so I've got a lot of major uh, empires that are stabilized, which we just discussed earlier. Why does that enhance trade? Just because I have large, stable empires? Safe. Safe for who? The merchants. 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 Give me a specific answer if you can. Uh, it, it became safer for merchants because they have uh, armies protecting them. Yeah, okay, cool. So I have large, stable empires, increased trade. And then the why is, if I have a large empire that's got me protected, I'm not worried about being invaded or invading as much as I would normally be. So I have more time, uh, peace time, first of all, and then time to myself uh, to worry about providing for my family. So that's when I would go into my craft more, I will make more things, so is everybody else. We're able to trade more, and the routes are safe, so it's easier to sell them and trade them. 
so everything is a bit safer, more stable, so I have more trade. All right, and anytime we have a bunch of uh, uh, stable empires, we have a, 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 an increase in trade, right? That's the same with the old classical era before that. When Rome was running and the Han Dynasty, we had the Silk Road going, right? Because there was two stable empires uh, keeping both ends somewhat safe. All right. So same thing here. So large stable empires increase trade, and then of course people are able to produce and trade more uh, because it's stable and they're safer. Got law and order, not being invaded as much, etc. All right, what, what trade network specifically though? Like what's this one? Silk Road. Yeah, cool. So examples of these trade routes. Silk Road. This one. Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean Trade Network. Uh, this one. Trans-Saharan Trade Network. This one. Yeah. Cool, that's, that's a good uh, amount right there. All right, let's get a couple specifics then. So let's do, uh, Timbuktu, what's this one going to be known for? Gold, gold ivory, salt. Nice, gold, ivory, salt, and the beginnings of? Slave, slave, slave trade, yeah. So the first West African slaves, of course, uh, during wartime between these kingdoms, they would take prisoners, and they would sell those prisoners voluntarily, um, and not the, the prisoners were not voluntarily being sold, but the kingdoms were voluntarily selling them uh, to the Arabs, right? That's going to start as early as like 1,000 CE. All right, and then the Portuguese, of course, when they come down a few hundred years later, they're gonna be like, well, that's a great market. Uh, they're gonna buy some and they're gonna send them on over to Brazil and the Caribbean and a few, I think less than 10% of slaves actually go up into North America. Most of them end up in Brazil and the Caribbean, but <clears throat> nonetheless, Portuguese are there to continue that tradition. Okay, um, so gold, ivory, salt slaves. We also have Islam here, why though? What? Who? Uh, Trade benefits in their government? Uh, Arabs. Okay, what about Arabs? Um, the Arabs have traded us. Okay, cool. So, the Arabs have uh, initiated this trade, <coughs> right? So let's not forget, why are they able to actually go across the Sahara Desert now? Caravans. Yeah. Caravans and camels, yep. I think I said this last week, but whatever, it's a double review for you. Okay, and then Islam is to spread, and again, the reason why is because um, they're going to adopt a lot of the Arab governmental policies, their administrative policies, and their religion, right? So if they're Islamic, are the Arabs more or less likely to trade with them? Yeah. More likely, right? So the merchants and elites are gonna convert there. We've covered that before, but I will, I will put that up here. So merchants, elites, convert for trade perks. And of course they, they learn Arab administration, but the Arabs learn from the Persians, so they're learning from the Persians. Okay. That was Timbuktu. Check. We did great, great Zimbabwe last week, I think. Swahili city states, cool. So the Bantu people migrated over here a long time ago. And then we have Arab merchants coming down here as well. Swahili city states. What I want to know about these guys is because it's pretty much the same goods. It's, uh, I believe it's gold, ivory, copper. I can't remember if they had salt or not, but pretty much the same stuff. So Swahili city. States. But what's keeping ships coming consistently to and from this coast from the, or the area of Persia and, and India? Monsoon winds. Yeah, monsoon winds. Nice. And why are these guys going to be uh, Islamic pretty soon? Right. Muslim Yes, the merchant diaspora of the Muslims. Right. So we've got a lot of Arab Mus uh, Muslim merchants settling over here, building mosques. Locals convert, of course, for the, that exclusive trade right, uh, those exclusive trade rights and um, benefits. All right, cool. Muslim diaspora. Excellent. Check. All right. <coughs> Calicut, that's just going to be enhanced by uh, a lot of the Delhi Sultanate st stabilization in the Hindu kingdoms <coughs> over there. Uh, Baghdad, obviously, is going to be enhanced because they're the capital of which giant empire that's connected all trade routes? Abbasid. Abbasid, yep. Yeah. Novgorod, what's going to improve uh, trade in Novgorod? Vikings. Vikings? How are they getting there? Longboats. Yeah, longboats go down the rivers. Long they go down the Volga River. They trade with the Byzantines and others. They also sail all the way around uh, in the Mediterranean. And uh, Novgorod is going to become a very powerful trade city. Uh, well, until the Russians just, just run them over later on. But uh, that's not until the 1500s, so we ain't there yet. 
But yeah, Novgorod and a lot of Viking trade and activity. And that's gonna be a nice trade center for the Baltic slash Northern slash Eastern Europe portion. All right, cool. Viking trades and accelerate that. How about some info about Venice? Uh, naval. They were a middleman, and they had a lot of naval power. Middleman for what? For who? Uh, for, the, for the Muslims and the European. Okay, cool. So you got European med medieval kingdoms, right? You've got the Byzantines, and you've got uh, Arabs and Turks. All right. So you're saying they're going to be the middlemen. What the hell is the middleman? Stands in the middle. Uh, they buy Stay, same with you on this one. Okay. So they buy products from the Europeans, and they sell them to. Yeah, they're the ones that ship or package the stuff basically they'll they'll purchase it or pay for it to be shipped uh just like a ups or amazon driver would uh, it is a little different though because you're right they do purchase the goods and then sell them for more later but they're still that connection so they established a lot of uh, contracts with the byzantines with uh some select uh, muslim uh pockets uh and of course in europe and they're going to become quite wealthy uh by facilitating all the trade in the Mediterranean between the uh, east and the, and the west portions of the Mediterranean. So, they get a lot of money, and they're very smart with it. They do two major things with their money that make their power even more, uh, I guess you would say, dynamic or greater in that era. Uh, established first bank houses. Yes, so they established the first bank houses. So I didn't write Venice up here, so here's Venice. Nice, so they're the uh, basically the inventors of banks, private banks. So. I can now store money somewhere safe, deposit later, instead of carrying it around or hiding it in the hole and hoping nobody finds it. Uh, that's gonna be a lot safer uh, than having like an imperial treasury or something like that. So be first banking houses. And we'll talk more about, oh, actually a little bit later, about how banks make money. Because when you borrow money from a bank, you're not just paying them back, you pay them back plus interest. So banking becomes, very quickly becomes a very profitable business. <clears throat> what were you gonna say? Uh, they in their power. Yeah. In fact, they're going to be so powerful that they're, as a city-state, able to rival the entire later Ottoman Empire uh, and their navy, well, with some help, of course, from Spain. Uh, but they're going to take on the Ottoman navy and defeat them at Lepanto, I think it's called, uh, around Greece. Uh, and it, that's uh, largely contributed to by the Venetians and their army, so, or in their navy. So they do uh, know where the power is at. Uh, you have a lot of Italian sailors uh, and naval ships and merchant ships, and they're going to control the Mediterranean for a long time. In fact, when they start exploring, they hire Italian and Venetian, uh, well, Italian is Venetian, they hire a lot of Italian uh, sailors because these guys are the best sailors around. So, I mean, if you guys didn't know, Columbus wasn't even Spanish. He was just hired by the Spanish. That's Venice. All right. Check. I already did the check. What two city-states are going to be well, first of all, run over by a whole bunch of empires, from the Persians to the Turks, to the Mongols, the Chinese, uh, basically everybody, and greatly enriched by Silk Road trade. Smart money, cash Yep, that's right where they're on. So Silk Road is going to enrich these city states, but again, they're gonna switch hands a lot because they are very unfortunately placed on or near the steppes of Asia, which are just like super easy invasion territories, just a bunch of flat grasslands. So again, the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Persians again, and then the Turks, and the Mongols, the Chinese, so everyone's gonna roll through there uh, at one point and uh, take all these. Ooh, what do these people call, by the way? The people over here? Zogdians. Zogdians, right. They're the merchants over there that are gonna be uh, well, quite wealthy for quite a long time. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, Malacca. Maritime. Okay. What two uh, major maritime empires is that gonna be a part of? Yeah, cool. So it's going to be a central trade city for the uh, Srivijaya and the Majapahit empires. All right, cool. Just a quick reminder as to what those guys are. So they're first, they're second. This is, uh, I think one of the years wrong, but it's of the 900s to the 1200s for the Srivijaya, and then the 1200s to the 1500s for the Mahapajit. All right. What religion is going to be there originally? Buddhism. Yeah, Buddhism and a little bit of Hinduism is going to get to those states, right? Obviously coming in from India, which is what your short answer was about. 
So that's going to trickle in through uh, uh, merchants. Again, that's Buddhism and Hinduism. But what's going to largely replace it in that area thanks to another diaspora, yeah, diaspora community? Islam. Islam, right. So he's going to shift from uh, Buddhist with some Hindu uh, to Islam. Same reason, though. You're going to have a bunch of uh, Muslim merchants coming in, settling, uh, and they're going to convert a large portion of that region. All right. There are conflicts, though, even still, between Buddhists and um, uh, Muslims in that region. Really, really violent ones, too, by the way. Which is odd, because you would think that Buddhists wouldn't be. But, I mean, they got to defend themselves, I guess. But they're not always the defenders um, in those regions. But anyways, so that is Malacca. Oh, wait, why is that one so powerful, though? Besides the fact that it's a part of these maritime empires. It's at the, it's at the trope yeah, point. it's at the trope point for the straits that are going through from the Indian Ocean to the very, very lucrative land of China. China. Yes, exactly. So you got to go by there, whether they're charging the toll tax later or just get there a pit stop. Uh, that's going to uh, yeah, greatly enhance their wealth. Renzo, you got to be awake, man. I'm going to kick you out. Yeah, you can't just sleep here for free for extra credit. <laughs> All right, so the other 30 of you are doing very well. So, um, Malacca covered. And what's my last one here? Hansu, why is this one going to be? Why this city in China? Why not what is later Beijing or Macau or whatever? Because it's connected to the American. Yeah, why does that help it out? You're like, I don't know, I just know it's connected. It connects north and south China. Yeah, so that helps why? So trade ideas and things can spread. Yeah, so they can send goods to this city to be traded or back up. Harder to do, but uh, that's going to allow a lot, a much easier set of transportation options. So you're going to have increased economic activity, communication, and transportation here, and that's going to center around Hansu, which is also the uh, one of the main pit stops for traders coming from Southeast Asia or um, the Indian Ocean. All right, sweet. So we've got, uh, let's all the trade city states. We got those? Sweet, let's do the social stuff, which is not that long. Well, the economic stuff's a little bit, but whatever. All right, economic innovations. So these are all going to be innovations that are going to make trade much easier and safer. All right, so economic innovations. So what you're going to know from the AP test is, um, of course, what they are, what they are, how they help, and where they originated for the most part. All right, so first one is, I don't know if this is the first one, this is the first one I'm going to talk about. This is going to make trade much more Okay, tell me a problem you, you might find here. If all of my wealth is in silver and gold coins, why might that be a problem for me if I'm moving around? Transportation. It's really hard because they're going to be bulky and heavy. Uh, it's easy to see if I have them, right? I can't really hide them very well. Like, oh, this is a giant sack of gold that weighs 80 pounds. Like, yeah, you're, you're screwed. So one thing that's going to really, really increase economic activity as far as making it easier to trade or hide, you know, if you need to, is going to be printed money, yeah. And who invents that? Yeah, the Tang Dynasty, right. Or at least they popularize it, the Song does too. And that's official. It's, it's officially printed by the Tang and Song governments. It's allegedly backed up by you know, silver and gold they have. Um, but uh, yeah, that's going to be a practice that begins as early as the Tang Dynasty. People are still going to be resistant to it, even in the United States um, in the uh, 18th century, and even the 19th century, actually. Printed money. Of course, that's going to make it much easier to trade and transport your stuff. Also, I have a much safer place to keep it. Venice started this one. Banks. Banks, yeah. And again, banks are very profitable, guys. They don't just loan you money or hold your money for free. They make money off of your money. So even if I just put money in there, they're investing that money in other things, in other companies, real estate or whatever. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when specific industries began, but banks were very profitable like right from the beginning. So what we had here in Italy, Italy was a lot of these city-states developed banking systems. They had large, powerful um, banking families, like I'm sure you've all heard of the Medici's before. Maybe you haven't, I don't know, but now you did. The Medici's, or the Juncker class, later in Germany, they're going to be a very, very wealthy banking family. And again, they make money because 
if they're holding on to your money, it's not just sitting there. They're loaning it out to people um, and collecting interest. So like, for example, if I borrow $1,000 and I pay it back over three years, do you think I pay back $1,000? No, no I probably pay back like $2,300. So like their interest rates are, depending on the loan, doubling the amount they're loaning out, right? Like in general, if you go to buy a house for like four or 5% interest, you're pretty much paying twice the house over 30 years for the most part, you can pretty much assume. So you're like, oh, I wanna buy a 300K house. You're gonna pay like 550, 600K if you get like a four or 4.5% 4 uh, mortgage rate on that sucker over 30 years. So banks make a lot of money off of handing out money. And they invest it too, but not gonna get into that. So banks, it does help though, because that enables me, if I have no money, to do what? Take the loan, yeah. I have to pay back more over time, but I can still get the thing I want now. All right, that's really gonna pick up economic activity. Because now, instead of, well, I gotta wait six years to save up for this tiny boat, it's like, nope, now I get the boat now, and I pay it off over time, right? So that's gonna rapidly increase the amount of stuff people can buy very, very quickly. All right, and again, it keeps your, your currency more safe, because you now can put it into a bank which is much harder to rob than somebody's house or a lone person walking around. All right, so banks, Italy. Examples of Medici's, cool. Uh, if I wanna transfer money from my bank to somebody, do I have to just have that physical money on hand or no? No, no. no. what can I use? Checks. Yeah, checks, <laughs> that's gonna be good. Uh, the caliphates are gonna start, those are called like socks or however you pronounce in Arabic. Uh, so you have checks, which of course, they're official documents which transfer money from uh, your bank account to, or your account, whatever it is, to somebody else or whatever business or whatever. All right, so make it much easier. So having to go to the bank, get it yourself, bring it, just run a check, they're gonna be able to deposit that uh, on their own. So checks, of course, from the caliphates. We also have, I don't know why I put invented coins on there, those are old. The Persians invented those a long time ago, so we'll just take that off. We've had those for a long time. What's the other one? Credit debit? Is that the other one? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. That one is very similar to a bill of exchange. In fact, I'll do these together. <coughs> Credit slash debit <coughs> slash bill of exchange. These are based on trust. So you would only do this one with somebody you actually trust, somebody you've got some sort of trading relationship with, like you know that they're an experienced or reliable trader, you've worked with them before, etc. Because a bill of exchange is like an IOU saying, all right, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna pay you on this day, right? So it's later, it's like, I don't have the money now, but I'm gonna come back in a month or whatever time you signed, and then I'm gonna pay you. So obviously you have to tra trust the person, because what could they do? Not pay you. Not, just not come back, right? Not pay you, right? So you can only do that with a company or a person that you, that you know, they're established, they're gonna be there, they're reliable, right? But it still works, because it can be much better. Uh, you can enhance the amount of uh, economic activity because people can buy stuff now instead of when they have the money down the road. <clears throat> all right, credit debit's the same thing. It's like a tab. You've all heard like put it on my tab before? Yeah. That's just what that means. So credit debit is, let's say I am uh, a merchant and uh, <clears throat> let's say uh, Aaron here wants to buy uh, a bunch of paper, all right? So he doesn't have the money on him, right? But I've done business with him before. He's got an account, right? And so I can just keep track of what he owes me, right? He's like, oh, I need this paper. I'll keep it on my account. I go, yeah, boom, $100. Here's your $100 of paper. Goes and does his thing. What's he eventually gonna have to do though? Yeah, yeah he's eventually gonna have to pay it, exactly. Uh, so that's where the, the credit debit comes in. So I keep track of that. Uh, if he's got $100 into the, uh, debit portion, I might have this backwards, but in the debit portion, uh, then um, he would have to give, add credit by paying it off later. So this would be $100, but I hope he can pay that off later, $100, and that cancels them out, so he has no balance anymore. All right, so that's all that is, just tracking your debt, essentially. Put it on my account, you gotta pay the account later. <clears throat> so I already explained it to you, but how does that actually, how does that actually, help trade? Uh, easier transportation. Oh. Credit and debit? You can buy stuff now and pay it later, so like, you don't have to buy it down the road. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's faster. 
Uh, it's just like the banks. You can buy it on that moment instead of down the road. All right, because if I got if you had to save up for everything, nobody would buy a house until they're like 40. All right, people buy them when they can barely afford them in like their 20s and 30s, and then they finish paying them off when they're old, basically, like 50s, 60s maybe. Depends on what you got in your loan and what loan you got, but that's when you finish. So if people had to save up for it, they wouldn't get a house till they were like really, really old. In fact, some people can't save money because they suck. And they would just never get a house because they would just buy a bunch of little things forever and then they would just die without a house or whatever. All right, so, uh, but if you've got a bill coming every month for a fixed amount, then people are better at just paying that. <clears throat> Regardless, uh, that helps you to buy big things now, uh, which is going to increase economic productivity. So we've got 20 minutes left. Y'all keep looking back there. All right, like you got anything better to do? Let's get rolling here. So economic innovations, those are covered. We have a new type of organization too, two new types of organizations. I know you got these in the notes, but I wasn't here to explain them, or my voice wasn't able to explain them because I was sick. They're kind of difficult, all right? So the first one is a guild. A guild is a difficult one to understand. So, all right, we're zooming in on Europe specifically here, because they don't, so far as I know, really exist outside of Europe. So a guild. I don't want to say they're like a gang, <laughs> but they have similar qualities. So what a guild is, is it's in like a town. Right, we'll just take our town here, Lathrop. All right, pretend we're in Europe and this is Lathrop. Uh, if I wanted to do something, I would basically need permission from these people to do it. And I mean economically, not, not just like, you know, I want to go to a park. I've got to ask somebody, that's not what I mean. What I mean is like, if I want to become a, uh, a baker, I can't just become a baker. I have to get permission from the baking guild, all right? And that's a group of families or other bakers. Um, so we're just using baking for now. And I need their permission to even become an apprentice, let alone a journeyman or master baker uh, later on. So these guys control industries. What do I mean by industry? Um, like clothing industry? Yeah, basically different professions. So it could be clothing, textiles, it could be baking, uh, it could be iron working, whatever. Right, so they control a certain industry. So in this case, we're using baking. I don't know why I picked that one, it just popped in my head. So in the baking industry, it's gonna be controlled by a guild or a group of people in a city, all right? So this is the baking guild. So they determine several things. Number one, who gets hired? So I could be filtered out immediately if they don't like me, all right? Does it sound a little exclusive if somebody can tell you if you can or can't do a certain job? Mm -hmm. It is a little bit, right? So what you're gonna have is a lot of corruption because people could just pay to get into certain industries or get certain privileges or jobs or whatever, but we're not gonna get into that. All right, they determine who gets hired. They, they determine how much you get paid. They determine what you make. They also determine the quality of what you make. So. I'll say technique and quality. So let's say uh, <clears throat> I become a baker. They're like, yeah, yeah, you can become a baker because you're the son of this guy who I like, so you can be a baker. So you become a baker. Uh, does that mean I can just roll in and start making bread however I want? No, no. no they're going to specifically tell me the technique to use as well as uh, what price to set it for. <clears throat> so how much choice do I have in all of this? No. No. Pretty much none. Right, so they're gonna determine my pay, they're gonna determine what I'm making, how I make it, and they're gonna inspect the quality for that part, inspect the quality. <clears throat> so, when guilds are popular during the, well, we'll just say Middle Ages of Europe, so between Rome, they don't start right when Rome falls, but between Rome and the Renaissance, how much innovation and creation and productivity do you think we have in Europe? Why, Why none? Feudal system. Yeah, okay, well the feudal system, Yes, and the church, you're correct. Those are not wrong answers, but I'm referring to guilds here. Why might a guild prevent me from, because you're totally right about the church, you know, trying to control knowledge and all that, but like why, uh, why would a guild stop me in an industry from being creative or productive or anything like that? Because they tell you what to make something. Right, yeah. So if I got a cool new idea about how to make something, am I going to be able to carry it out? No. No, because even if I do it, they're going to push me out of town. Literally, you know, push you out of town. Uh, so... That's why guilds are going to be good if you're in the guild, but bad overall if you're not in the guild or if you're trying to do something new or different. 
all right? Uh, when those disappear, all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of uh, new creations and innovations that, that uh, spring up. Okay, cool. So guilds. Guilds become very powerful. So these guilds in towns begin, this kind of looks like a cell, but whatever. So here's the bakers, here's the iron makers, here's the textile workers, that just means clothes, basically cloth goods. Um, what else? Lumberjacks. What other jobs are there? Furniture makers. Cobblers. Cobblers, all right. <laughs> Cobblers. I got all my guilds in a particular town. Are those guys gonna be fairly wealthy and powerful? Yeah. Yeah, they dictate the industry, cool. What could they do to make themselves even more powerful, though? Raise up prices. Okay, they can do that, but what if people can't pay for it? <clears throat> Here's what they do. They say, all right, we've got our industries unlocked, we've got the prices unlocked, all that stuff. Um, what we're going to do, though, is we are going to work not just with each other, but we're going to work with guilds in other towns. I know. So, you've got other towns, like uh, Manteca. Right? They've got, actually, I should use actual European cities. <clears throat> Let's go with uh, the biggest merchant town at the time, which would be Antwerp. You're like, what? That's in modern day, uh, like the Netherlands slash Belgium region. <clears throat> Antwerp was really, really known for their large textile industry. What are textiles again? Oh, yeah, basically like linens. Okay, cool. Textiles and other things. All right. And this is uh, it's another merchant town, Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. Make your jokes. <clears throat> All right. So these two uh, cities and the guilds in them are going to work together. All right. Normally, back then, if I'm going to come from another town, I know this is a weird concept because we live in the United States and you can just drive from town to town, and it's like who cares what city it is. Back then, though, like your city was like your country almost. Like, those were the people you knew and grew up with. Everybody else, like, shouldn't be trusted. So, if I roll in from another city, like Munster, yes, that's a real city, um, they're going to, well, first of all, be very skeptical of me because I'm from Munster. But second of all, any goods I bring in, like if I'm, let's say I'm bringing in my baked goods, why would people in Amsterdam not like me bringing in baked goods from Munster? Because not yeah, because who controls the, uh, the, 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 guild, the bakers the here? Guild. Yes, the guild, the baking guild, right? They don't want your money going to them. They want your money to go to them, right? They don't want you buying Munster baked goods. They want you ba buying baked goods from, uh, from Amsterdam. So what could they do possibly to make sure you buy their goods and not the Munster goods? Um, what? There you go. It's called a tariff, right? So they're going to charge him extra to sell uh, stuff in Amsterdam. That's called a tariff. That's a tax on imported goods, stuff brought in from other, in this case, cities, but it's meant to be countries, all right? So that's a big deterrent. So do you think, do you think many people are gonna go out and try to trade with their cities if they're, if they, if they charge twice as much? No. no, because people aren't gonna buy it. It's like, well, why would I buy $10 bread if I could buy $2 bread, right? They're not gonna do it. So these guilds begin working together. They start making eh, corruptish deals, <clears throat> and they get rid of this tariff thing. And they agree to work with the guild and form kind of like a super guild, Munster, uh, and just basically increase the amount of money and power that these guys have by kind of uniting. All right? So now, instead of Munster and uh, Amsterdam being rival guilds, they're friendly, almost like a united guild. All right, so no tariffs, they can just trade in between. So they're gonna have more economic activity. And if you get more money, what could you start doing with that money? Spending it. Spending it, that's true. But what could you buy to potentially protect people that are going between? Yeah, exactly. So they start doing things uh, like funding private armies and navies to protect their uh, trade routes. And of course, now they have power too. So let's say Antwerp's like, we don't want to be a party little group. Screw you guys, you guys are dumb. What could they do? <laughs> ah, they could potentially bully them into it, right. So they could either offer their services to other cities, 
cheaply, so they, they lose all their business, or they could use their uh, navies and armies uh, to pressure them into joining their group. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. So what this is going to form is the world's first trade organization known as the Hanseatic League, or Hansa. So it's, it's kind of like a bunch of local gangs that start working together like a larger gang, uh, kind of. I'm oversimplifying, and I'm not saying they're all evil, but <clears throat> they're going to work together to control industries and hire themselves private armies and private navies. So they can spread their trade, they can spread the amount of people that are buying their stuff and not buying stuff from competitors. All right. They get so powerful, actually, they begin pressuring kings into allowing their uh, trade cities to trade for free, like no tariff. Like, I think they convinced, like, uh, what was it, Henry II or something of England? Uh, these trade cities kind of coerced the king of England uh, to accept a tariff-free trade agreement with them, um, or else they were going to basically blockade them, like not trade with them at all. So he kind of had to. So uh, this, this Hanseatic League is going to be quite successful, and they're going to control a lot of the trade up here in Northern Europe. All right, they're just going to spread. They're going to start in the German areas, uh, and they're going to spread their influence throughout this, uh, <clears throat> this North uh, Sea and this Baltic Sea region. All right, that's kind of an abstract concept, especially to learn at like almost 4 o'clock on a, on a Thursday. But um, that's pretty much how it works. So you need to know, first of all, what guilds are, and then how guilds in these towns worked together with other guilds <coughs> to kind of make a super guild, uh, a big trade organization. And again, a trade organization just means you guys work together, and there's no tariffs or barriers between you. <laughs> yeah? All right. Um, what is it? So it's women and the travelers. So uh, women. So overall themes they want you to know about women is they want you to know areas in which Patriarchy? Did you tell what patriarchy was? Yeah. yeah we learned about it. You did. But you're like, I remember that word. Male dominated yeah, society. Yeah, male dominated society and families, right. It doesn't necessarily mean tyranny, but it does definitely mean that sometimes. So, areas where this more tyrannical patriarchy took place, and then also areas in this era when it got a little more relaxed. So, let's do the uh, patriarchal areas first. So, Increased patriarchy. Well, it's basically going to continue everywhere, but the biggest example we have of this is going to be <clears throat> a new practice in China, voluntary or not, that's going to uh, actually maim females to make them seem as if they are more petite, beautiful, and successful, or at least part of a higher class. Foot uh, binding. binding, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll say Neo Confucianism. Because uh, who's at the top of the hierarchy in a, in a Confucian society? And, uh, yeah, ancestors and men, right. So male ancestors especially, but yeah, uh, males at the top, uh, women definitely uh, below. And of course, they're going to add that cultural element uh, in the Song Dynasty, which is that foot binding, which we discussed earlier. This is kind of just a refresher on that. So Neo-Confucianism, foot binding, definitely going to be an example of increased patriarchy. So what I don't want you to think is like somehow everyone... Women across the world at this time are free. No, they're extremely limited in the entire world at this point. In fact, right now, here in the West, the United States, Canada, Australia, Europe, it's like the only time in the world that women have actually been, have equal access and treatment uh, compared to every other country in the world and every other time in history. Uh, so, it was just the norm back then, but it was a particularly bad at this time period in this era. All right. But there are some areas where it was a little more relaxed, or, or at least it got a little more relaxed. So, areas of relaxed patriarchy. <clears throat> um, Buddhism and Christianity uh, are going to offer opportunities for women to um, basically, because both of them are open to anybody, so you can become a Buddhist monk or... Uh, part of a Christian monastery. So like you guys have heard of nuns before, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so nuns are essentially saying, I'm not going to live under any <clears throat> patriarchal society, although they are te technically usually headed by a male priest, but um, they uh, are able to live, live independent lives, essentially, um, aside from men, and they can focus just on their Christian faith, just like the Buddhists do uh, as they uh, pursue that uh, ascetic lifestyle. So Buddhists, 
Buddhism and Christianity offered an option for women to not be as controlled uh, by either becoming monks <clears throat> or uh, living in monasteries as a uh, no, or a convent, actually. They're called convents. Convents as well. Nuns. All right. Another example is... Oh, by the way, Buddhism spreads in Japan. What do we call the uh, syncretized version of uh, Shinto, Shinto Buddhism? Yeah, not Shintoism in Japan. So that's going to expand there. There's another group of people. <coughs> they're not permanent settlers. And they're generally slightly more egalitarian because women have to set up camp and move and help feed and, 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 and uh, take care of the animals just like men do. They don't do as much of the fighting. But which, which, which uh, group would that be? The Mongols, I know. Man. Yeah, so yeah, pastoralists. Nice, like the Mongols. And again, still definitely run by men. But when you compare it to other civilizations, women had a slightly larger amount of freedom. In fact, they had that princess, Catulun, uh, who uh, was able to rule. Uh, I don't know if it's a myth or not, but apparently she said she would give all of her horses, which was like 10,000 or something, uh, to the, any man that could beat her in a wrestling match. And, and uh, nobody ever beat her. So she, no, it wasn't just the horses too. She said she would marry any man who could beat her in a wrestling match. And she was a princess with a bunch of horses. So it was like, all right, when a wrestling match, basically won a bunch of horses, uh, which was like their currency. Uh, and uh, nobody beat her. She still married somebody, but <clears throat> it wasn't because he beat her in a wrestling match. So, another example is, this one requires a, a little bit of explanation. It's, uh, it's called gender parallelism. <clears throat> this is in the Americas. Alright, so here's, the, here's what I want to qualify it as. This doesn't mean that women had equal... Uh, authority, like so, the heads of the government, the military, religion, knowledge, all still men. But in the Americas, that wasn't seen as the pinnacle of society. It was seen as one role we have to fill to keep humanity going. All right, and the women, in this case, had to fulfill the, of course, child rearing, child educating, uh, home based life. Right, but. If you think about it, do we still need that to continue humanity? Yeah. Yes, we do, right? So what they, they did was, they said, okay, men and women have different roles, but no one is superior to the other because we need both. So that's where the parallelism comes in place. So definitely different, right? So you're not going to see any women religious, political, military leaders here, but uh, they're seen as equally valuable because the jobs they do keep human society and families going. All right, so that's gender parallelism. So and they even had their own gods in some regions, like... The men were more oriented around the sun god, and the women were more oriented around the moon. Uh, but they were both seen as equally contributing members of society with different roles. So does that make sense? Yeah. So again, not going to see any female leaders here, but um, they're not looked down upon for, for the role that they do have. All right, cool. Last bit <coughs> is... Uh, oh, agriculture too. Damn it. Agriculture and travel. I can do both of them pretty quick. Travelers are super easy. I got Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta, he's from Morocco. I've got Marco Polo. He's more than just a pool game. He's a Venetian merchant. And I've got Marjorie Kim, who is a rich woman from England. So, they're going to, I'm not sure if she was rich herself or she married a rich husband, either way. She was rich. And I do believe her and her husband voluntarily became celibate, even while married, as part of a religious theme. She was, she was pretty pious, meaning she was very devoted to God. So all three of these people are going to be, so we got Christian, Christian, and Muslim. All three of these guys, and the girl, are going to, uh, well, not have enough money to do this. They're going to travel throughout the world. They're really the first people... I mean, the Vikings did this, but they were going on raids. They weren't just going around to write and see what they saw. These are travelers, right? They're not like, again, I'm going to go trade, or I'm going to go invade you. I'm literally just going to see stuff and write it down. All right, so they're in like the 12, 1300s. Maybe the first people that really travel the world and document it for people to, uh, to read about. All right, so Ibn Battuta goes all over the Islamic world, Dar al-Islam. 
He's going to go to West Africa, going to go on his Hajj. He's going to see the Saudi Arabia, Middle Eastern area. I believe he even dips into the Indian Ocean uh, and East Africa. So he sees like the whole Islamic world for the most part. All right. And he catalogs it in the book, Marco Polo, uh, because the Mongol Empire uh, is in existence, or at least recently was. Traverses the Silk Road, visits China, Hong Tzu, comes back and tells his tales in Italy. And Marjorie Kemp goes from uh, uh, England, she stays in Europe, but she goes throughout all of Europe and sees all of the major uh, sites and relics there in Europe. All three of them are going to catalog this, and all three of them, uh, especially the first two, their books are going to be wildly popular. And again, why do you think they're going to be so popular? Yeah, nobody's done this before. Nobody knows what the rest of the world's like. So it's going to be something that captures the imaginations of people. So the two things I want you to know about this is are these guys all are going to be, <clears throat> how can I phrase this? They're going to admire other civilizations. So some of the accomplishments they have. Like Ibn Battuta really appreciated the way that the uh, uh, West African women dressed because they wore almost nothing compared to what the Arabs did. Uh, he was pretty impressed with that one. Um, as well as the Indian civilizations and Arabs. Uh, Marco Polo was very impressed with uh, Hong Tzu and how organized the city was and how orderly uh, their governments ran. Uh, but, and then of course Marjorie Kemp's impressed with a lot of the relics she got to see. But all three of them are going to comment on how inferior and barbaric other cultures were. So they're what you would call narrow-minded. Like they have this idea of what's right and wrong. And they see other people doing what they see is wrong, they are going to be very critical of them. So they're going to criticize other. It's not prejudice. Prejudice is when you have an irrational hatred of a group. All right? This isn't that. This is them thinking. Here's an example. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Muslims can eat pork. Am I wrong about that? No, they can. They can? They, they can. can. Okay, yeah. Okay. So here's an example. Uh, that's a rule practiced by Ibn Battuta, right? He sees that as a dirty, unbarbaric practice, okay? But if he rolls out into Europe, or maybe in West Africa, do they eat bacon and ham there? They do in Europe. So how is he going to see that? Yeah, he's going to see this barbaric and dirty and you know, inferior, and condescendingly, essentially. He's going to write about it. So they all do that. Uh, I think Marco Polo, I don't remember the details. They were eating something. I don't know what animal or insect it was. And he uh, couldn't get over how gross and barbaric and uncivilized that was. So that's going to be the, that's going to define their writing. Both admiration of these other cultures, as well as uh, critical and narrow-minded regarding their cultures. All right, cool. Now it's the last section. These ones are super quick. Agricultural innovations. This is all just review. So I've got chopper rice. I've got waru waru. I've got chinampas, and I've got terracing, and I've got the horse collar, but we'll leave that one out. So which one of these bad boys was a new strain of rice that was drought resistant and cultivated in half the time, spread throughout the entire Indian Ocean and raised the population? Chinampas. Oh, there you go. Which one was where they went to shallow lakes, added dirt or used dirt that was there to garden on islands that looked like floating gardens. Uh, where was that? Uh, yeah, Mesoamerica. Which one was the one where, I don't think I told you this, but maybe you'll get it. You can't farm on hills because they're, they have a grade, right? Uh, water runs down, etc. So they figured out if you kind of carve steps into them and make kind of like a staircase around the entire hill, oops, that's not very flat, you can actually grow stuff. Uh, and use these hills. All right? What's that called? Terracing, Terracing right? That's going to start, as far as I know, in Asia and spread. And lastly, this is the region in which they experienced flooding. So instead of leaving flat ground that would just run over and ruin their crops, they would uh, dig small trenches and add that dirt to mounds so the water would run between, save them water, and their crops would live on top. That's Wara Wara. Where though? Thank you. Oh, I should have said Wara Wara was it. That would have been great. Where is it? Yeah. South America. Yep, South America. Incans. Bye.